This weekend, get to Kohl's and take an extra 15% off. Save on tech gear for the family, now just $15.29 and under. The Ninja Foodie Indoor Grill is $279.99. And find denim everyone in the family will love for $18.69 and under. Plus, get a little more for your wallet with Kohl's Cash. Plus, fast and free store pickup. Shop Kohl's and Kohl's.com. Select styles. 15% offer valid January 14th to January 18th with promo code SNOWMAN. Some exclusions apply. See store or Kohl's.com for details. This weekend, get to Kohl's and take an extra 15% off. Save on tech gear for the family, now just $15.29 and under. The Ninja Foodie Indoor Grill is $279.99. And find denim everyone in the family will love for $18.69 and under. Plus, get a little more for your wallet with Kohl's Cash. Plus, fast and free store pickup. Shop Kohl's and Kohl's.com. Select styles. 15% offer valid January 14th to January 18th with promo code SNOWMAN. Some exclusions apply. See store or Kohl's.com for details. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net. From Asthma Core Studios near Detroit, Michigan, it's Unregimented. Gangsters, what's up, guys? And now, here are your hosts. Welcome back. It's Unregimented, episode 190. Thanks for tuning in again. My name is Aaron. And I'm Rich. And Chris is working hard today. He couldn't couldn't make it, but that's all right. We've got plenty to talk about, I'm sure, this week. Trump is yeah, his, definitely his, 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 Yeah. I was going to say real quick, his attendance record's been exemplary. In three years, he's missed, what, three oh, two yeah. episodes? So. <laughs> R- right. Well, he's out on the road. That's that's tough. They, they w- he, when he gets time off, he gets to relax, but they work him like a dog when he's out there. Definitely. But, yeah, Trump has definitely been very entertaining for me, at least, this week. Um, I mean, it's still kind of enraging, but when he treats, tweets ridiculous stuff, like, finally, after keeping us on the hook forever on these tapes that he brought up, he now tweets that there are no tapes and no recordings that he knows of. Like, what? Do you not realize how insane this looks? He must be a horrible poker player because that was just a horrible bluff on his part. And that's all it really was. I, well, I mean, did you ever believe it for a second that there were recordings? No, I think he was trying to intimidate Comey into, into not saying anything. Right. Maybe even refusing to testify. Well, right, by by showing his hand that there were actually no tapes, that uh, th- this might be evidence for, um, for yeah, witness tampering. Is not that, that how you would say it? Evidence tampering? It, uh, uh, witness co- coercion? <laughs> I can't say that word. Coercion. Coercion. Something like that. I'm no lawyer. I don't know, but it, it's definitely. I, I don't know that it's it's actionable, but it's just more mounting evidence. I mean, if you profess your innocence so much, and your and your dwindling supporters still do, why do you keep acting so guilty? Yeah, and I mean, if you have nothing exactly, if you have nothing to hide, you don't try to intimidate someone into. Oh gee, I hope there's no tapes. I mean, it's it's basically it's like something out of The Sopranos, you know? Guys showing up, be like, "Yeah, it's a nice plate glass window you got in front of the store. It'd be a shame if a brick right. went through it." I mean, these are, these these are strong arm tactics that are mafia movie, you know, tropes and cliches. And he's trying yeah, if, it from the highest office in the land. If I was to try and get inside of his brain to figure out what he was thinking, I mean. I think that he thought he was being very clever with his language and how he was presenting his case to Comey. And and he felt like he didn't cross a line, even though he he made his intentions clear. He didn't give anything actionable. So he wanted Comey to give an exact rep- representation of what their conversations were. And he thought that that would exonerate him. When in, indeed most people saw right through it, because it's not a very veiled threat that he makes. I mean, he's, I, mob boss is exactly it. It's he starts off with like, "How you liking the job? The job working out for you? Oh, you're liking the job, huh? Well, I'd sure like to keep you on. 
you know, if your boss comes up to you and says that shit to you, you're thinking, what the fuck is going on? Am I getting fired? Is he threatening me? Like, what the fuck is that? And and it comes up, I think, three times in their conversations about, uh, I mean, clearly the man stayed on. Yeah, he likes his job. You don't have to confirm it with him. But yeah, I, I feel like he thinks that if people just look at the naked language of what's going on, uh, of the, the actual conversation, if you just wrote it out on paper, you'd think, oh, nothing to see here. And I think that's why he tried to press Comey with the tapes so that he would, if there were tapes, and Comey being a smart man would, I mean, he he made memos of all of these conversations that he had. So he didn't even want to rely on his memory or his perceptions of, of things necessarily. I mean, clearly it's going to be colored through his perception because it, that's all that one person can do. But he wanted to get the cleanest version of events as possible. So Comey was already going in there with that. There was no need to try and press him not to fudge things, you know. But ultimately, I mean, it was a, a lousy bluff because what is the end game here? As soon as you say tapes, everybody's going to want to know where the fuck the tapes are. So eventually you're going to have to... and. It, Maybe he just like waited for enough time to pass so that he could go, oh, yeah, there are tapes. But moving on, health care. Yeah, I think he waited for what he thought was going to be maybe a good moment for him to, to just drop that because everybody was talking about something else. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's not just a him move. That's a politician's go-to move, you know. 100%. I mean that's 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 a tried and true tactic, and everybody uses it because I hate to say it tends to work with our short attention span in society. So, but I mean, still, it's well, you know, I, I, I mean, if for I don't this even guy, know do that. Think, go ahead. I was just. Do you even think he cares about his like quote, quote legacy? I mean, because he's just leaving a, a trail of just pure fuckery. In his wake, and it's... Well, isn't I, that I, his legacy? I mean, his legacy is go in, make a bunch of money, make everybody notice me, leave a bunch of debt, and move on to the next project. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, he's kind of like, he's like a locust. Yeah, exactly. He comes in, he destroys, and he leaves, and there's no, nothing is better off after he, he's been there. And, I, I mean, I hate to say it, because... It's going to sound anti-American, anti-capitalist or whatever, but, I mean, isn't that the epitome of the American businessman? I mean, you know, they've wrote well, books and movies about it. Barbarians at the Gate was, you know, all about these type of people. That's interesting just, because we have a lot of different types of the American businessman in this country, but the ones that we tend to hold up as examples of that tend to be the more well I mean look at uh, well, Elon Musk is somebody who gets made fun of constantly in the news about his wild plans for going to Mars and doing all these things that people just think are insane and aren't even possible in their lifetime and that's only because they don't really have much of an imagination and whether he succeeds or fails, at least he's trying to do something with it. And, you know, he's somebody who, who sat down and, go, and said, what do I do with all this money? Here's, and, and came up with an answer for it. What do I ultimately want to do? What does anybody want to do? We're, we're by nature, explorers. Or um, uh, what's his name from, uh, uh, from Microsoft? Uh, <laughs> Bill Gates? Bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it, he constantly gets slandered as just you know some globalist libtard, and who just thinks that he can throw some money at it. Or where and what's Donald Trump? I mean, he's like the worst example of a rich, successful person in America, and we we don't make fun of him. And I mean, sure, there's a there's a good chunk of the population that will constantly make fun of him 
no matter what, regardless of how uh, of whether he gives them fuel or not, because they just disagree with his policies. But the people who who claim to stand up for you know the things that make this this country great, and one of them is the ability to come in, make a lot of money, and apparently not give a fuck about what happens to anybody else. That, well, they'll be helped with my tax dollars or I'm making jobs, so automatically their lives are better because of me. So, yeah, I mean, we given a multitude of different examples of what a person with an obscene amount of wealth can do, we consistently pick the greedier ones to be the heroes. So I guess that is the epitome of the the ugly American. Because we, I think we, being- we elevate that person more than we do the others. The others we, we ridicule for having, you know, too wild of dreams or or whatever. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, we, we have a long history of that. And it's just now with social media, the internet, the world being shrunk down to where something happens on one side of it and you can instantly, you know, stream it to the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. We've just, and and with the anonymity of the the internet allows you, we've really let our id just run wild and unchecked. Because, I mean, think of of someone like the Wright brothers. Think of the first time they, they said to somebody... We're going to invent something that we can fly through the air. People had to look at them like, oh, are you fucking stupid? People don't fly. Well, they did, yeah. Right, yeah. You know, but when they did, when they when they came up with, you know, the prototype and it took off in the air, everybody stopped fucking laughing. Right. So, I, I, but, I mean, nowadays it would be, they would make the announcement that they're going to do that. Everybody would goof on them and laugh at them. And... It would it would it would happen. I mean, I, if we get to if we actually if if Elon Musk actually puts human beings on Mars before I die, I want to know how many people are going to bite their fucking tongue and go, "I was wrong." I don't think it's going to be many. I think I think especially these days, people see reversing yourself as weakness, and I think that's well, and those those type of people are the type of people who look at a guy like Trump and goes, "He never apologizes, so he's strong." Right, and that's what I want in my leader. You know, decisiveness is valued more than hesitating because you're trying to think of the consequences of your actions. And I mean, that's something the military teaches you. Apparently, it's I. I don't know. I've never been. I've been around a bunch of military people my entire life. Never been around high-powered businessmen, but apparently, it's the same way. Just make a decision, stick with it, and stick to your guns no matter what. You know, now behind closed doors, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they are. Maybe some of these types are a little bit more humble. I highly doubt it in the case of someone like Trump. But we don't really see that side of them. The side well, we no, see I, is is the bullying and the the never admitting I was wrong and the half ass bluffs that anybody who's played even. A few hands of poker could have looked at Trump and been like, oh, please, dude, that's the worst bluff in the world. I hope there's no tapes. Really? Okay. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's childish, really, isn't it? I mean, this is, this is shit that, like, like the children do. And we, we scold them and try to teach them a better way of, of, of doing things. And these are adults. These are adults who are playing not with Monopoly money, but to them, it might as well be. They don't. I mean, do you think if Trump loses a million dollars, he even fucking blinks? I mean, he don't care. He well, cares no, he because lost. he's he's figured out ways to still make money even when he loses it. That, well, which yeah, is there's that too. another. That's that's the bigger reason. Everyone thinks Russia is the reason why we can't see his tax returns. The real reason is because he doesn't want everyone to see how he actually doesn't make money off of a lot of these deals. It's a cut and run and then take some sort of tax break or get some sort of government subsidy or manage to write it off in some way and, ma- and make it a win. And that's what Trump has succeeded at is, is, game, is working a gamed system, which is really the only thing that I do respect him for. I'm not going to say that I, 
I mean, it, it's different than making a moral decision on whether somebody's a good person or not. But yeah, I mean, it, we've got a fucked up system and he was smart enough to figure out how to make it work for him. I mean, I, I guess more power to you. But yeah, the fact well, that not, not, not literally, <laughs> <I don't. laughs> yeah, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think mean, that's what that it is. Old, I think that people take that literally. They're like, yeah, more power to him. The fact that he Let him, that he he has the money to hire people who can comb through the tax code and find these loopholes, and that he surrounds himself with people who can find a way to turn complete shit and they can squeeze every red cent out of it they can get before they move on and leave just like I said a, a trail of destruction in their path and he holds on to that knowledge because I mean think about that it's it's I, I keep going back to this analogy because it's still it's the one that makes the most sense to me but it's like people who have succeeded in the art some way music whatever and they hold on to like they don't offer freely how they did it most people don't most people just give you very vague answers and even if you sit down mm -hmm. and talk to them one on one you know hey man how did yeah. you end up doing this oh well you know we do hard work and you know well, stick to it yeah. and it's like okay but you know, what really happened who did you know who did you talk right. to whose palm did you grease because we know that that's how this system works it, 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 and that's not it, Isolated to yeah, the nobody arts. tells I mean, the story about, politics. well, I got a manager and, you know, he's the one who actually got us a label deal and the label gave money to the radio station. But, I mean, I think maybe part of that is, uh, is you know, not wanting to see the little guy get a leg up. But, you know, I, I think the, the perfect example that I've seen of that type of attitude boiled down to one person is a is at least your average DJ when I was coming up in the nineties. Techno DJ playing anything underground. A, a lot of them would carry in their bag, they'd just take the shittiest record in their collection and they'd cut the center out so they had a little disc that was just the size of the label. And they'd put on a record, and then they'd throw that disc over it. So that when you came up to see, oh shit, what's this track that you're playing? Because it's pretty badass. All you see is the shitty record label. I mean, it's, it's kind of a dick move, but it's also ingenious at the same time. Yeah, but my thing has always been, really, are you that poor of a DJ that you think that... I mean, let's... If anyone knows anything about that type of DJing, you understand that it's not just about what tracks you pick to play. And the way that you mix shit, it's more about the order that you play them in and sometimes even taking tracks that nobody saw anything in and figuring out ways to make those work. And it's not... I mean, sure, there's, there's certain records that will stick out to the crowd that, that the crowd will actually know that you can grab them with. But overall, I mean, if you think that somebody could do what you do just by buying the records that you buy, well, then you're not doing very much up there. And I'm not flagging DJs in general because I think there is an, an art to it. It's not just about picking records, at least for, for true DJs, not your average sports bar guy. But no, I mean, I agree with you. And it's, it's Eddie Van Halen, when... Van Halen was first put together and were still playing the bar circuit before they even had a record deal. When he would do, you know, his two finger tapping, he'd turn his back to the audience to to hide what he was doing from right. other guitar players. I think that's such a stupid attitude. You know, which is funny because somewhere out there, I did see a video years ago um, of Jeff back in the seventies, well before anyone even knew who the fuck Eddie Van Halen was, and he was doing two handed tapping. And so if Jeff Beck can do it, not hide it, you know, but that's just, right. to me, that explains well, just, the difference in personalities that we're talking about here. Like Jeff Beck would be the Elon Musk and Eddie Van Halen hiding it would be the, the Donald Trump. Right. Yeah. Jeff Beck wants to share it with the world. Look at, look at this cool shit I can do with this guitar. I'm going to show everybody. And, 
Eddie Van Halen is a little bit self-conscious or self-important, one of the two, because he thinks that he invented this shit. I mean, first of all, he didn't even come up with it, and then he doesn't want anybody else to see how he does it. So, I mean, if is that all it takes to be Eddie Van Halen is to learn how to two-finger tap? Well, then Eddie Van Halen isn't doing that much. And, I mean, to be clear, I... Oh, I'm not a huge Van Halen fan. I think Eddie Van... It's no contest that Eddie Van Halen's a very talented guitar player. I think anybody who's touched any instrument can understand that. And there's there's more than just technique going on in there. Yeah, and then the fact that he, but, he also... He's brought some innovations to just playing guitar and equipment and stuff like that that most people who don't play don't understand you know right. if, if i mean you know the fact that he was hot rod marshall amps in his in his garage and i mean no one was walking around at that point wanting to play you know old plexis and then when he come out boom everybody wanted it and everyone went out and bought a plexi and said why don't i sound like eddie van halen because it's a heavily modded plexi and on top of that unless you attempt to sound so, like someone you're not going to just plug into the same gear they use and sound exactly like them. There's a whole lot of technique and touch that goes into into sounding like that. But, I mean, that's that's conversation for a different day. <laughs> right, yeah. I would tell so, uh, customers at Guitar Center, like, okay, so you bought all the right gear. How many years did you put in so far? Yeah, I know. I, yeah. Dude, like, uh, why doesn't this sound like this? I'm like, dude, it's just time. It's lots of time. How thick are your calluses? I, I've. Uh, this is something that has irritated me. It used to really irritate me. Now, now I guess I just, whatever. It's become a cliche, so I just go, whatever. But when I was... Uh, first starting to play the you know one of my major influences and he was still alive at this point was stevie ray vaughn and when he died all these middle-aged lawyers and doctors and shit went out and started buying up all the gear that he played that was gear that nobody wanted in the 80s that you could literally go pick up a a, a tube screamer and yeah you know old black old old blackface fender amps because everyone wanted racks and you know, the pointy ass guitars and all this solid state, this and this and that. And right. It's very rare that equipment comes out and becomes an instant hit with artists. Like, usually it sits around for years and then somebody does something extremely cool with it, like Kurt Cobain, and everybody wants uh, oh, uh, a stone throw chorus. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it drove the price of all that stuff up. And it got to the point where, Guys like me who, in, when I first started playing in the 80s, I didn't want an Ibanez. I didn't want an ESP. I didn't want a Jackson, a BC Rich. I wanted, you know, a Fender, uh, you know, a Strat. And yeah. I, now all of a sudden, boom, $2,000 for a brand new Strat. Whereas I could have picked one up, if I had had the money in the 80s, I could have picked up a fucking vintage Strat for probably a couple hundred bucks. I, mean, I had a buddy right. that bought a, bought a 65 Strat in 1990 for a thousand dollars. That same guitar is probably worth 15 grand at this moment right now, and I'm saying it's probably the low end of it. So, I mean, it, it's it's just that's a little uh, it's a little pet peeve of mine. And they, and here's the, here's the real bitch of it: they bought all that equipment, just all you know. I got the exact same year, exact same this as Steve Ray Vaughan, and they don't sound anything like him. And they get pissed and don't understand it. And it's like. It's because you bought the car before you knew how to drive a stick, dipshit. You know you can't you can't compete in a fucking drag race if you don't know how to fucking sh- shift the car. I don't care how fast the car is; you have to be able to drive it. So right. Whereas, uh, you know, with politics, that doesn't really seem to apply. No like, politics is definitely a tr- fake it till you make it. <laughs> right. Trump was just like, I just got to get the right suit, and then, you know. Well, Trump is really I mean, the right things. Can you think of a politician in history, not just American history, just world history, that has just jumped the line as much as Trump has? I mean, just went from nobody to boom. You got the highest office, elected office in the land. Right. Well, I mean, I mean not I, nobody. I mean, he was world famous. Nobody in the realm but, of politics. 
So if we were yeah. talking four, four years ago when he started with the I want to see the birth certificate shit, or that's five years ago now. Oof. Time flies and you're having fun. No one would have thought in a million years he was going to end up running for president, let alone being president. It was just him, in my opinion. Well, I, I just thought he was being petty because he didn't agree with Obama's politics. I didn't realize that his master plan was five years later to be president. Right. I, I think most people laughed it off as a joke. I think there were there were people that didn't because they saw, well, what you have uh, basically an attack dog with an empty head that you can just fill with whatever. You know, I don't believe that, that Trump came up with these policies on his own. Somebody's whispering in his ear, hey, immigration, that'll be a big one. You know, make make that your, your, your the, uh, Tent pole of your politics, and when and we've I brought this up before, but watching an old D.L. Hughley stand-up special from 2008, he was he was talking. McCain was saying the exact same thing: build a wall along Mex- uh, the U.S. Mexican border. And you know, mm-hmm. D.L. Hughley, it, maybe there's comedians or people that had brought it up before then, but this is the this is the first time I remember hearing it, it was from him. He made the joke that everybody made. How are you going to build a wall to keep Mexicans out when Mexicans build everything in this country? You know, now that's yeah. become that's become a, a you know a hacky joke. But at the time, it was you know, oh shit, ha ha ha, you know, that's funny. But I mean, that so that's it's almost a decade ago. And if you know, if McCain was saying that in two thousand eight, some politician was saying that before him, and he just he appropriated it from him. Well, yeah, I mean. There's nothing really all that new about what what Trump is saying in any respect. I think he just cherry picked all the all the things that he saw that politicians promised and couldn't get done. I mean, we did get somewhat of a wall. We we got a lot of fence on the border. <laughs> and we, we didn't necessarily. Well, yeah, but they're, they're self-employed. Yeah, self <laughs> self-driven. Yeah, right. Uh, so, you know, ultimately it was a political game of, well, you know, we want to we want to show that we're that we're uh strengthening our border, that we're doing something post 9/11 in this country to to keep bad bad evil doers out. And uh so but ultimately was it practical, feasible to build a whole wall on the border? No. So we we strengthened it. Uh, it certainly changed our immigration policies, and you know, put up a, a double fence with barbed wire on a lot of places on the border. And I don't know, maybe we slowed down some immigration. Most likely not. I mean, it, not even slow it down because you probably have the same amount of people coming over. It just took them a while to figure out what alternate route they were going to take now that it was fenced off. So Yeah, and, and something, just real quick, I, something I never really yeah. understood. I, I guess I'm seeing it more, or we are seeing it more now as time goes on. Is it is really the the, the, the slowing down of immigration and the building the wall and all that, that's almost taking a back seat to, really, he doesn't want people coming from countries that could possibly be, you know, Muslims who are coming here to do us harm. I mean, I just read a story that you know that 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 ISIS is, is looking to deport Chaldean people from parts of Michigan, and I'm going, wait a minute, Chaldeans are Catholic. Yeah, Chaldeans are not Muslim. So I mean, it, you, at this point, it's like, okay, so if you're from the Middle East, we just don't want you here. Okay, is is, is sorry, the message? I- I miss I misheard you, and I just wanted to correct this real quick because I think our listeners might too. ICE is deporting. I I thought that you were saying that ISIS was oh, trying no, to ICE. get right. No, I, I hear it. It makes sense. I don't know why I would think that ISIS was trying to get Christians out of Michigan, but but yeah, uh, go on. <laughs> So, yeah, so, I mean, what, what does it come down to? It comes down to we don't want anyone. I mean, this is, if I was Chaldean, this is the message I would take away from that. If we can look at you and think you're Middle Eastern or from the Middle East, 
or if we look at you and we d- we decide by your looks that you are, we automatically assume you're Muslim. Get the fuck out of here. I mean, that's what I would take from that because I know yeah. growing up around here, I know a lot of store owners who are Chaldeans, and I've had conversations with them. And people have come in, and you know, especially when you own a party store where they sell liquor, people come in drunk. Oh, you fucking terrorist! Blah blah blah. They take a, they take offense to being called Muslim. Like they get pissed. I mean, not every not all of them, but I mean. Like they're like, well, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm no fucking terrorist. I'm not some Muslim that, that wants to bomb people. I'm a, I'm a fucking well, Christian for Christ's sake. You know what are you right. what are you it's cussing like me thinking, out for? It's like meeting an Asian guy and being like, show me some karate. <laughs> I know. <laughs> or hey, I bet you're really good at math. You know what? Right. right. <laughs> what you think that we're born with like a fucking ca- uh, calculator in our heads over there? Shit. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that I was listening to an economist on the radio today talk about the idea of this 3% growth that Trump is promising us and how unlikely and damn near improbable that would be to actually happen even for a short period, much less sustain year over year. Uh, When... When the economy is doing well, we are at around 1%. So you're talking just tripling that number without actually having any plan in place to do this. I mean, I, I guess you could you could argue that it all kind of leads to that, his, his plans for tax reform, uh, tax breaks coming from the new health care bill, and the ways that he feels like he is... Uh, and bringing back, you know, manufacturing and coal and stuff like that could all lead to that growth, although there's no evidence for that. What does add to that growth, according to economists, is, well, people working. And in order to get growth, you need more people working and producing and he he did say look, by the numbers you could just go okay well let's take the current population and just say everybody works six days instead of five then you might get close to that number but that's not going to happen and what you would actually need to accomplish that type of growth I mean more babies aren't going to do that they take a good long time to become members of the workforce you have to bring those people in from other countries. I mean, you want to. I if you if you're if you're just looking at numbers and you're not you know, afraid of people who have different skin color than you, you want to look to every other country to try and pl- attract their best and brightest. And that is how you grow the economy. So there there's no way that he's going to be able to produce on this 3% growth year after year and reduce immigration and kick keep, kick people out of the country. And, you know, a lot of the stories that we're hearing from here in, in, in Michigan, I mean, like I've said before, I, I'm in Taylor, I'm right next door to Dearborn. And there's a lot of stories about, you know, them rounding up people for uh, they're going after people who have uh, a quote unquote criminal record and that could mean that your criminal record is that you know you overstayed a visa or you know didn't report on time to your uh, immigration officer or, or whoever they report to it could also be you know, getting into some dumb shit trouble, you know, or getting caught with a joint or something, or, you know, even uh, if you served prison time, you served your time, you're done. The idea that they could, that they want to, they want to make it like everybody that they're getting out of this country is either violent or is, you know, taking advantage of other people or the system or something like that. And they do that with the shorthand of these are all criminals. But let's define what you're calling a crime. Because if we saw the list of crimes, I mean, a lot of this is just stupid shit that even average people, you know, get wrapped up in. I mean, shit, if I wasn't from this country, they'd try it. They'd definitely be deporting my ass. 
and I'm a fucking taxpayer. You know, I don't break any fucking laws anymore. But have I done dumb, dumb shit in the past? It, have I trespassed? Yeah, I got a ticket for trespassing when I was at uh, an illegal rave. And, you know, even though the, ultimately the, the case was thrown out, that's on my record. If I wasn't born in this country, they could easily scoop me up and deport me for that. Which, to me, is the equivalent of throwing someone in jail for a nonviolent drug offense. It's right. asinine. You, we have better people to allocate our time and resources to getting the fuck out of this country, or to putting into pri- put the, or putting people into prison than these people. But this yeah. is this is the these people who of, a lot of them are are taxpayers and working steady jobs. Well, this is the equivalent of you know a mayor gets elected and crime is out of control, and he runs on we're going to crack down on crime, and so the police go out there. And they make hand-to-hand buys, and they rip and run, and they get a small amount of drugs, and they pump up their numbers with, you know, look at all the arrests we have. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, you, yeah, you they take get a one quota. Person, yeah, you take one person off the corner, and before the day's over, there's someone else standing on that corner. You did nothing in the grand scheme of things except forgive yourself job security. Yeah, you put a lot of addicts in in this, in cells for short periods. You you got your ground level guys, maybe off the streets for a couple of years, maybe, but th- th- you did nothing to stop the drug or crime problem in your area. You just your, your chief told you, "Hey, mayor says we got to crack down on crime. I need five arrests this week from each one of you. I don't care how you get them." And I'm not saying. I'm not saying that, that people who are here, you know, illegally or on an expired visa or whatever the fuck, who have committed serious crimes should just be given a pass. But I think we really need to redefine what is a serious crime and what is a victimless crime. And I mean, to me, a victimless right. crime, why, why are you serving time in the first place? I mean, a well, victimless crime I, is just that. I mean, right. think about some of the laws around the books. If you try to kill yourself and you fail and the cops find out, they can charge you with a crime. Are you serious? But, I mean, but it's, nobody's... It's, I don't think a lot of people are that concerned about that difference. They see a, a victimless crime is the one committed by your son, and a serious crime is one committed by somebody that you don't know and somebody more likely by somebody with a different different color skin than you, or from a different socioeconomic background, or right, right. Oh, that per- that person's. Oh, where's that person from? That person's from downriver. Well, you know how they are downriver. It's Taylor Tucky down there. You know. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, you're sitting in Farmington Hills. I, it, yeah, I, I mean, I got it. It's just well, I, to I mean, me, it's just it's it's like we have much better things to worry about than rounding up people who. Are going to pose no threat just because they look the same as these nut jobs who were brainwashed into committing acts of terror. Okay, well, uh, you guys, you know, it's it's almost like the Family Guy skit where they pull you know Peter over and they hold up the the color chart, and if you're darker than a certain color, then you're getting arrested. And he they hold it up next to him, <laughs> and he's like in the safe zone because he's white. And they go, "Have a nice day, sir." I mean. <laughs> It's, I just picture ICE agents going into party stores, holding that up, going, eh, you're a little dark. And the guy's going, right. no, my friend, I, I had sun, I, I have a suntan. Nah, come with us. You better come with us. Just just make sure here. Well, yeah, there's an interesting example in the news this week. And this is uh, a horrible story about uh, a young girl. She was like 16. She might have even, even been younger. Young Muslim girl who was killed recently. Um, I know there's been so much going on in the news. I don't know if you've heard this story. But what happened was, apparently, there was a, a group of, of young Muslim kids who were making their way at, like, dawn to or from the McDonald's or the, uh, the mosque. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if they were coming from their prayers at the mosque or going to them. Regardless, there is a, there is a bunch of them walking down the road. Uh, there was uh, a man driving 
on the road, got mad that all these kids were on the road, and chased them off. Or at least everybody in the group thought that they were just chased off. What they didn't know is that the girl who was lagging behind actually got caught, taken in the van, taken into a secondary location, beaten to death, and was left in a pond. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, this incident is being classified by uh, by the police and by a lot of press as an incident of road rage. And they're being asked to classify it and, and press charges as a hate crime. Now, I'm not a fan of the concept of hate crime. The concept of... I mean, I understand that motives play into the the type of punishment that a person gets for committing a crime, but that's an almost unprovable motive. I mean, whether you hated them, you, clearly you hated them enough to kill them, you know, whether it was because of their background or their skin color or you know, what they wore or whatever, it's kind of negligible. But if you're going to have the concept of hate crime in the law, how can you not apply it in this situation? Yeah, and, and r- road rage? I've been involved in a fist fight at a red light due to road rage. Uh, no point did it enter my mind to kidnap the guy, drag him someplace, beat him to death, and leave him someplace. You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like that—that That is, like, road rage is a guy cuts you off, you flip him off, he flips you off, he pulls over, waves you over, and you go, okay, fuck it, let's do this. Right. I mean, that, now, is, a, that is premeditated. And I don't know. Murder one, charge him with that. You want to throw the hate crime on there, too. I guess in sentencing, that's going to matter. Well, no, because a hate crime is considered a federal offense, isn't it? Yeah. That's a federal so, charge, so, okay. But right, still, I so, mean, I mean, you would assume that you would have uh, maybe more competent prosecutors um, and who are more driven to, you know, see a hate crime on the books and definitely going to a higher security prison. Well, my question is, I've known people who have been in an incident of just a fight and someone will say, yeah, okay, well, I know where you live, motherfucker. I'll catch you later, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they get charged with terroristic threats. How is this not an act of terror chasing down a group of people based on what you assume is their religion? I mean, isn't the definition of terror is targeting a certain group and to strike fear into their into their hearts and their psyche? Mm-hmm. I mean... That's it, part it, of it, yeah. I, well, you know, there's more than one definition, but yeah, I mean, that's that's I'm sure it's somewhere in one of the definitions of that word. So, I mean, it seems to me, boom, you got multiple things to charge this guy with. But the to me, the, the bigger story is the media painting it as a road rage. How do you get that out of this? And, right. Well, and it's I, interesting I, what, what media is applying that term, you know, because violence against Muslims doesn't necessarily play with their audience, but violence does, so let's find a way to spin this so that they can, you know, it, it, so that they can uh, read this story and feel that it lines up with their viewpoint of the world already. Whereas, you know, somebody hating somebody for being a Muslim enough to want to kill them doesn't line up. I mean, I'm not a big fan of of flipping stories in the way that like, oh, you know, if, if this was a Muslim that chased down a bunch of white kids and killed them, it would be a totally different story. I mean, it would be a different story, though, because you would definitely see Breitbart and Fox News and everybody on the right latch oh on to that story even more. That would be a top billing story <sighs> instead of, you know, underneath health care and the other, the other big stories this week. Dude, the, the floor in the studio at Fox News would be stickier than the floor in a porno fucking <laughs> theater. I'm telling you, they would just blow all over the place for a story like that. You know it. And right. I mean, and, and see... And it, it, it's, so it's about what's not said as much as what is. It's, it's about... It's the same way with, with people on Twitter. You know, these uh, alt, alt-right people that I, that I follow on Twitter just 
I don't know because I hate myself <laughs> that you know they'll they'll publish stories and they're like, well, you know, I'm not wrong and this story happened and this is true and I'm yeah, but in the bigger picture of things, if you look at your feed, all you're doing is finding stories where Muslims did something that you thought was horrible, right? So in nowhere in there are there any stories about any Muslims doing anything good or any people, uh, any white people doing anything bad. So it's just about as much of what you don't post as what you do post that, that gives away your true motive. Because a lot of them want to say, well, you know, we're not racist. And, uh, y- you know, our, our, our beliefs are about respecting every race. Well, no, it's not. It's clearly not. Because the stories that you're interested in sharing with everybody else are all specifically about disparaging people who have different skin color than you. Yeah, and a lot of people will paint that as that person is racist, sexist, what, what you know, depending on what what who they're what group they're cherry picking to make look bad and ignoring anything that makes them look good. And that is true, but at the same time, to me is just lazy thinking because it's giving in to the easiest lowest common denominator of reality and i mean it's uh, consistency and to not be a hypocrite is something that is hard to do that's why so many people don't do it it's just easier to look for things that confirm your biases and go oh there you go and it's just lazy and i mean you know i find it amazing that in this country we and I mean, you know, full disclosure, I'm a fat ass myself. So, I mean, I'm including myself in this. You know, we get on people for being fat and they say, oh, you're lazy. You don't want to do the fucking work and blah, 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 blah. But we let they make intellectual lazy. Yeah. We make, you know, and there there is truth in that. I mean, there is. I mean, I'm just, I, t- for me to be my ideal weight, the only time I was even close to it, I worked out with the Marine Corps three times a fucking week. And drilled once a week with them. I mean, and we're talking four hours at a time. And, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I to keep that up through my entire life, I just didn't have it in me. Like, I, I literally, at one point, like, woke up one morning and said, I don't want to keep doing this because I just don't love life that much. <laughs> it's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it's making me not love life. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I constantly hate it. I constantly hate walking around thinking about every single little thing I put in my mouth and you know you can't do anything because I got to get up at the butt crack of dawn to go out and do this shit before I even start my day and I've expended more energy in in four hours than most people will do in three days time you know the average person will do I should say not most people Um, but so I mean there's there's truth in it but we we have such a hard on for people who, oh, you fat ass, you just, you're disgusting, blah blah blah. But we just give a pass to intellectual laziness. Mm-hmm. We we just, in fact, we encourage it. And I mean, I don't know if we've ever really had this conversation, you know, you and I. But a lot of this seems to me that it comes off as the media doing exactly what the quote unquote conspiracy theorists accuse them of doing all the time, which is you want to keep the people in the middle as far as economics and at the bottom, especially at the bottom, you want to keep them fighting each other. That way no one pays attention to what's going on up top. They're so worried about, hey, what's that neighbor over there who's darker than me doing? Oh shit, these people are moving in. They pray to a different God than me. I mean, and it, 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 it I don't know, like I said, it's just lowest common denominator human behavior. And we don't even call any people. We don't call people on it. We let them get away with it. And I, I mean, I, I, you can't police other people as a whole with that. But you can start by, if you have a kid, raising them not to be that way, making them think about, okay, you instinctively go to this side of this issue. Now try to consider the other side of the issue. I mean, isn't that what debate was for? Debate was they give you an issue and they assign you a side. And you, to under to be a good debater, you had to understand both sides of the issue because you had to argue. You didn't master. know what side you were going to argue from. Right. So that's critical thinking skills, something that we just don't seem to value anymore. And 
schools aren't going to teach it. Colleges aren't going to teach it anymore, with a vast majority of them, anyways. So, w- w- someplace it's going to it's going to have to start with. If you have this kid, it's not just your responsibility to make sure this kid makes it to eighteen and they get out on their own. It's your responsibility to instill in this this small person who will grow up to be a member of society to think critically. And that's going to it comes back and bites a lot of parents in the ass. I was told constantly by my dad, I wish I didn't teach you to think, to be an independent thinker because by the time you hit 14, you drove me up the fucking wall because you wouldn't listen to anything I'd say. You would argue with me about everything. But at the same time, I I don't want to I don't want to paint my siblings in a certain light, but um at least when my little brother hit that age, I was the one that was taught to that more than my other sibling. So it, it helped me along later in life. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, once again, it's the lazy way of parenting. It's the lazy, it's the easy way out of take, taking the easy way out of doing something. It's just easier just to go, okay, whatever, and let your kid do whatever. It's harder to, okay, look, you, you know, don't, don't have a knee-jerk reaction to everything. In fact, instead of being reactionary, why don't you try being proactive about some things? And maybe if we did that, maybe in a couple generations we'd see a little bit of forward progress because, I, I mean, as of right now, there's very I, – I don't, I don't see it. I, I see in the news. I read the news. We were talking about it before we got on the air. You know, when – at least when, when I was like, I don't want to do the show anymore about a year and a half ago, it was because I burnt out because I couldn't leave this shit at the show and then walk away from it. It was – I was obsessing about it every day. You know, going to yeah. work and talking about it and talking to my friends about it to the point where I actually had friends who started pulling away from me because they're like, oh, my God, dude, here comes Rich. He's going to fucking start an argument about some political shit. <laughs> you know, I became a miserable person to be around. And, I, you know, it sounds like I'm arguing against my own point, but I mean, it's just that's that's the media nowadays. It's everything negative and bad. I mean, we used to have the stereotype of in America, we love when a star hits bottom, but we love a comeback even more. I don't even think we enjoy the comeback anymore. I think we just yeah. want to see our store. Our, 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 the, the people abo- who are, quote unquote, above us tore down, and then good. That's where you belonged in the first place. Now stay there and shut up. And I mean, that's not, that's, it, 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 that's bad enough to apply to pop culture figures. That's not a way to look at politics and things that affect your life and affect your ability to live a good life, you know, a healthy life, a, a, a happy life as much as you can. I mean, no one's ha- going to be happy 24-7, but it seems like we wallow in misery. And no one ever looks around and goes, hey, guys, have you noticed that we're sitting here just wallowing in piles of shit constantly? <laughs> and when that person does, we go, shut up. We like wallowing in shit. Shut up and just keep shoveling it into your mouth and, and rubbing it in your hair. I... I I don't know. I, it, it, like I said, it goes back to just laziness, and it's intellectual laziness. And to me, that is that is that is a huge sin because we've been given the ability to think. And I understand that not everybody is capable of thinking in the abstract and and be able to understand gray area as much as other people. But that is something that can be developed like any other skill. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think a lot of these, a lot of these stories we see, where it comes out like, "Oh, this is a this is a road rage incident." Anyone with any critical thinking skills would read that story and go, "Okay, this is fucking stupid to call a road rage incident." But mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, who does that? And 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 what's the, the bigger sin is why are they presenting it that way? I mean, we you well, covered the reason why, but I mean, that's the bigger sin. We should hold them to a higher standard than that. Like, no, you don't get to choose the 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 easy route you wanted this job you went to school for it you want to be a journalist be a journalist and that that means sometimes doing things that are going to make you unpopular but we're but journalism these days isn't journalism journalism is once again it's partisan pick a side and you only report on what makes your side look good right i mean the fact that people accept organizations like breitbart as news and not opinion should tell you a lot right there it, and by the way I, did you see uh, Bill Maher last week when he had uh, what's his name from Breitbart on that, that was quite entertaining to listen to him try and present the, 
Breitbart as uh, as a real news organization. I know, I, and it, uh, I, it'd be like if they had the editor in chief from Jezebel online <laughs> talking about, "Well, we are very balanced, and you know, we are even handed." Right. No, you're fucking not. Stop. You know, you are basically right. an entire site of op-ed. Well, That's it. you know. Rich, you mentioned earlier about people thinking in the abstract, and that's that's interesting to me because I think last week I mentioned that I'd started reading the book Sapiens Mm -hmm. about the development of mankind, and he talks in there about how uh, Homo sapiens' greatest attribute, the one that allowed us to prosper in the way that we did and to organize in the way that we have is the ability to be able to think of abstract concepts. So just having, I mean, what he defines as abstract concepts are, well, governments and religions and uh, and businesses and money and all these things that aren't tangible but affect our lives because we all believe the same story. You know, the only reason the government operates is because everybody, for the most part, most people in America are all believing the same story, that there is a government and that it has power over your life. That is an abstract thought. Definitely definitely applies to economics as well because we all agree that this piece of cloth with dead presidents on it is valuable. Right. So he the way he lays that out it's it's no different than than the uh the abstract of of religion and it's all there basically to to give us a structure to build relationships on. You know, if we're all if we're all Americans and there's all a reason why we're here and we have at least some common ideals with all those seem to be getting further and further apart. But it's it's all buying into that bigger story that that brings us together as a society that makes us a society because when you, when you just look at one on one human relationships you in order to be in a group with somebody, you have to trust them on a certain level. This is the way that he describes it in the book, not me and there's been studies shown that a person can only really have a I guess intimate might be too extreme of a word because you think that you know you're sleeping with the person, but actually knowing somebody, you can only actually know at a maximum 150 people is what they found. And without a bigger structure to that, you can't organize those. If you get a, a, a small tribe of 150 people, you don't need an overarching government and a bunch of rules on a tablet and, a, and necessarily even a god to bow down to. You pretty much know everybody in your society. You know who to trust and who you don't. You'll certainly form your cliques and your close friendships in there, but you'll have a certain level of trust. That, and, and it's only when you need to grow bigger than gr- a group of 150 people that you have to start coming up with I- abstract concepts of religion and government. But it's also our attachment to these abstract uh, concepts and our sincere belief that they are real that also restricts our thinking in the same way. Now, this isn't from the book. This is me kind of going off on a tangent from it. But yeah, it is that that ability to to think it in the abstract has allowed us to grow, and it also constrains us because you know the the alt right are all believing in this abstract concept that there is you know whatever uh something better about white people than any other race or something special about white people here in this country at this time and it's a it's a silly concept but without it they don't have that group that they can attach themselves to. Yeah. I don't know. 
Well, it, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of the guy's name, and I can't. I just listened to a podcast with him, but he was talking about how things like religion was it served a practical purpose at one time, and <clears throat> like, okay, if you go back and read the Old Testament, there's a oh shit. I think it's I, I can't remember what book off the top of my head. It's been a long time since I cracked open that. That book of fairy tales. Um, there is there's a whole book in the in the in the Bible that basically breaks down rules of what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do, and a lot of them were practical for life two thousand plus years ago. Yeah. You know, stay away from pork. Well, they didn't understand. We didn't have refrigeration. We didn't have ways to keep meat from going bad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That made sense back then. And basically, his point was is that these things did serve a purpose at one point, and it still as parables could serve a purpose. But just like training wheels, we've evolved past the point of needing them, and we need to find something else. And I guess his, his premise was basically, you know, religion has is, is stood the test of time because it's something that to believe in, you just go, well, you have to take it on faith. You, there's no there's no proof one way or the other you just have to have faith in it and people mm -hmm. are comfortable doing that but at, you know at a certain point it's like okay when are we going to evolve past that <clears throat> and start looking at maybe and it's maybe I'm, I'm paraphrasing him badly at this point uh Start looking at science as the new religion, and right because it is the it's the next step. I mean that's why people are extremist, extreme uh, fanatics, religious fanatics, are threatened by the concept of science because it's the next evolution of your beliefs. It is. It all comes from the same thing. I mean, we wanted to know. Uh, all number of things as early men on this planet, as early people. And there weren't answers. We didn't have the tools to explore the world around us and find out the answers for why things happen, where babies come from, and what's the, the fiery ball in the sky, and is it always coming back? And so there's a, in, when you have that uncertainty, you have fear. And when you have fear... You have an unstable society. So in order to calm that fear, you start presenting answers. Now, that's the same thing that we're doing with science. Only, you know, we found out a lot of the answers to the, the earlier questions that we were answering with religion. So science should supplant religion. Well, also think about this. Think about, take a scientist from 100 years ago with what we knew a hundred years ago about the solar system, just to pick a topic. Mm -hmm. Now, if we still believed, or if that scientist could come to today and said, what you guys know now is bullshit because I know the absolute truth from a hundred years ago, he would be, he'd be looked at rightfully so like a caveman. <laughs> right. That's not how this <laughs> works, buddy. You know, and that's, that's where, as hard on religion as I am, that's where a lot of my my beef with it comes from, is it allows you to have a static line of thought that never encourages growth. It never encourages questioning anything. And, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, you can, because I, I do it quite often on this on this podcast. I get lost up my own ass questioning things from time to time. Well, quite a, quite mm -hmm. a bit, in my opinion. But to me, I, I'd rather do that than just accept, oh, well, like, you know, once again, oh, we, we just had a storm here in, in Michigan. Oh, well, that was God, and he's angry with us. So we, we, we better do something to placate him. No. Right. And, I mean, science is, look, these are the, this is the best explanation we have today. Tomorrow we might have a better one. And you have to be. You have to. You have to be. Your mind has to be malleable. Has to be able to, be able to understand that things change, and that's okay. And it, it's human nature right. to fear change. And I mean, right? It, it, I think right. It, it was. Uh, oh gosh, I wish I could remember who said it. It might have been listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson's podcast. But you know, a lot of criticism that science get is 
the scientists get is that well they're always wrong they're always changing they're always coming out with new studies you don't know what to believe and uh, uh, the point that was made by the scientists like, probably was Neil deGrasse Tyson was that yeah we are always wrong because that uh, that is our our eureka moment is when we're proved wrong yeah you know you go in thinking you know, I think X and Y are going to be the results of this experiment and ends up all Z, but you get answers. Yeah, and I, that's not something to be, <clears throat> it's not something to take personal. It's not something to get angry about. It's not, right. it's not something to, to go, oh, well, this person just wants to tear me down. It's, and, and maybe that's because right. we've, we, we're just, we're so used to that. To, well, to where well, if we're told, about, no, you're wrong, we look at that as a negative instead of going, oh, this is a chance for me to learn something. Well, yeah, there's a little bit of pride getting in the way there, certainly. But if you think back to, again, early man who, you know, didn't know what the fiery ball in the sky was and was uneasy about it. And religion provided him with answers, right? And those answers made some kind of sense, obviously, to him because he went along with that religion. Now, when science gives us answers, there's a lot of people out there who are still uneasy, but that doesn't calm them. That that doesn't give them a you know. When we think of well, all the the breakthroughs that we've made just in the micro and macro scale of looking at the subatomic world and the and the universe at large. I mean, I guess I can kind of understand that because it is a little unsettling, you know? Think, of, think back to uh, most people as kids, whether they had religion in their lives or not, had to look up at the night sky and have an adult tell them that that goes on forever. And you're just like, no fucking way. How can it? It doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make me feel better. But there's an excitement there, too. You know, I, I wasn't comforted by a universe with no borders. It was a mind boggling thought, but it made me want to know more. It makes me still want to know constantly more about what the, what the fuck's going on in the universe. Yeah. And, you know, I, if, if you're comfortable with what you know and... And new information just makes you feel more fearful. Well, I don't know that I can blame you, but it it doesn't make sense for me to. I mean, I don't know where I'm going with this one. Well, I I, I was what 19 when I moved out to upstate New York, and mm-hmm. it was the first time in my adult life that I was away from major cities. As far as I was, I mean, I w- I literally was in the middle of nowhere. Like, it, like, you wanted to drive to Target, it was a forty-five minute drive type thing. You know, there was like a McDonald's, a Pizza Hut, and a Burger King in town. And if because the grocery store closed at eight, and so if you didn't do your grocery shopping, you had to get to those places before ten because that's when they closed and they rolled up the streets at ten o'clock at night. And I remember going outside when I first moved there and looking up, and it was. It, <sighs> It's going to sound really cheesy, but it's the honest, it's the honest to, to whatever deity of your choosing's truth. Um, just looking up and having like a childlike wonder, like, oh my fucking God, look how many fucking stars are in the sky mm-hmm. that I didn't see it when I, you know, when you live in a city just because of all the light, you just don't see them. And I had this conversation recently with my little brother, and, you know, he's 25, and he's going through a lot of what people go through. At that age, he's, you know, dealing with the thought of his own mortality and et cetera, et cetera. And I brought it up in a discussion we were having. And he said, when I, th- if I, when I see things like that, that makes me anxious. I almost, I'm on the verge of a panic attack. Right. Where I, whereas I was like 19 and filled with like wonderment. Like, I, you know, if I would literally trade my life on this planet to visit one of those stars in its solar system. I would have no problem. I mean, I would miss all my friends. I'd miss the little bit of family I have. But as long as, it, you know, <laughs> as I was promised that I could get there, see you later, guys. 
I mean, that's that's oh, that's yeah. how it made me feel. It, it to him, it's like, oh, I can't deal with that. The thought of infant, you know, infinity and something that never ends, and it it seemed to, you know, and I'm assuming this, it seemed to just overpower his mind to the point where his fight or flight or or freeze instinct kicked in, and that's you know, that's essentially where people who have panic attacks that, that that's where it's born from mm-hmm. is is a, is a hiccup in their fight or flight or freeze. Right, and so so have we outgrown religion? I mean, I know those of us who don't have religion in our lives and are okay with that think so, but, I mean, if we want to think that, if we think that there's a lot of people that live in fear in this country right now, how much more fear would they have in their lives, and how much more ir- irrational would they be acting if they didn't have religion to give them some comfort? Because clearly they're not comforted by science. Well, yeah, and I, and I tried to, and he's he's. I mean, he is. I believe he would describe himself as an atheist. I don't even think he's. I think he's hopped off the agnostic bandwagon. Mm-hmm. He's just purely there is no god. Period. Nothing. And when when I hear people say, you know, oh man, oh, you know, well, if there's no god, what is there? You know, doesn't death scare you? The only thing I can say is, I don't know. What did you think? What, what was it like before you were born? Oh, I don't know. So you weren't right. conscious of that time period? No. That's probably what it'll be like when you're dead. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> that's a guess. I mean, that's a guess. But to me, I take more comfort in that than a petty. And, and this is not just the Christian God or the you know the God of Islam or whatever, or any religion. I, then a petty God who says, "I'm going to set up." All these religions, and you better choose the right one, and you better worship me in just the right way, or else I'm going to torture you for eternity. That's terrifying to me, more so yeah. than just ceasing to exist and having and just consciousness stopping. That's almost peaceful in my. I mean, that's like, as opposed to the to 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 the other option. I'll, I'll take that every day. I mean, mm-hmm. and so, but I mean, I get why when when. People have conversations like this, and we have these conversations. People get anxious. People get defensive because it does trigger something in them. And much of the same way that when you start talking about things in science that challenges their beliefs that maybe they were raised with or they came to on their own, I mean, it really doesn't matter. A a, a true blue believer that's a Kool-Aid drinker doesn't matter how they got there. It matters that they're there. I understand why they bristle at it so much, but the thing is, how off, how much can you lie to yourself and look yourself in the mirror and go, I have no proof of this, but I'm going to take it on faith, and, it, and here's the thing, it's a, non, it's a thought that doesn't evolve. I mean, if, like right. I, once again, if science was static, if it was, this is what we know, and this is it, and there's no question in it, and it's all there is to it, I would look at scientists just the same way as I look at televangelists. You're selling people a pack of bullshit lies. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, honestly, you're the worst kind of parasite because you're feeding off of their fears, off their fears and their, their, their fear of the unknown. But that's not what science does. And, once again, some people can handle it. Some people can't. Some people can deal with mm-hmm. it. Some people can't. So have we grown out? Have we evolved past religion? I think this is one thing I'll give the, the millennials. I mean, I, you know, one of many things. But it's it's one of the things that I think is is a good thing. I think they're the generation that's even more secular than we were in Generation X. Yeah. And I mean, I, I understand that well, as you get older and closer to death, you're going to have people who are going to get scared and they're going to start falling back on the comfort of the religion they were raised with. I don't think it's going to be right. in the same numbers that I see people doing in my generation. Well, that might be comforting to me, Rich, if if they weren't treating celebrities like the new gods. You know, I, I don't see it as... Instead of moving to just being purely... I mean, they might describe themselves as a- atheistic, but they have a re- religion of celebrity that they attach uh, uh, attach people to and aspire to be. And that might be even more powerful because this is you know, something that you may be able to obtain in, in some people's minds. But, you I know, mean, maybe I think that's a, I, maybe that's a hiccup in the next step towards our evolution is yeah, that we maybe. have to go through that. I mean, 
I never really thought of that until you brought it up just now, and I I, I can't disagree with you. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's kind of a it's kind of an unsettling thought. I mean, should, you know, it, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that as long as we're talking about uh, being an atheist, I think I think I'm actually going to stop referring to myself as an atheist and just stop using that word because. Uh, and this isn't a completely original thought. I, I, I know I've heard this from some place, but the, the idea of being an atheist, I mean, what what is it at its core? Not having religion. So it's a term that is used as the absence of something, and it's only used because the prevalence of religion is so powerful in in our history the history of humankind has all been built around religion so this concept of not being part of some organized religion has to have this name but it isn't really so by saying that I'm an atheist it means that I constructed a belief system that is against this traditional belief system, and I haven't. And I don't define myself as the absence of Christianity or the absence of Islam or any other religion in my life. So what does it really mean to be atheist? I think, I think to say I love, I love science and believe in science and logic, and I have no organized religion. I mean, that's enough right there. I, I don't need to put myself in this box of being an atheist because I mean like every other label there's other there's uh, assumptions that are made about you by well, other yeah. people when when you when you when you put yourself in that box yeah and just as there's stereotypes for Christians that right right the hard the hardcore atheists throw out there the hardcore Christians also have now stereotypes for atheists and it's it's to me it's a it's a petty argument because I to me if you, if you're a true blue atheist why are you even talking about God unless you're talking about your God shouldn't affect my life in any way whatsoever that should be mm-hmm. the only time God comes up but atheists are almost obsessed with especially evangelical atheists which may sound like an oxymoron but it's not when you hear the at least my description of them they're like. There is no God. I believe that, and I have to make you believe that. And right, right. How is that any different than people knocking on your door at seven o'clock in the morning on Saturday talking about Have you heard the good news? You no, know, get the fuck off my doorstep before I can show you the business end of a shotgun. There's your good news. I'm giving you a warning. You know, I mean, it's it, it's no different. It's not going to call myself an agnostic. I can't prove it. I can't disprove it. I, I, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful there is some sort of creator, but I'm pretty damn sure that none of us have ever talked to it, him, her, whatever the fuck. Right. I mean, I'm pretty sure, like, 99.9 to infinity, per, you know, percent sure that no bush has ever caught fire and this creator talked to anybody through it, you know, or any other crazy stories that you can read in any religious text. And people go, oh, well, you're only an agnostic because you're a fence-sitting piece of shit that won't pick a side. You're a chicken shit. No, it's the most logical way to look at it in my mind. And until someone tells me that, explains to me another way that makes more sense, that's more rational, more logical, then I'm going to keep thinking this way. But I'm open to someone trying to explain to me why I should be an atheist or I should be a, a, a religious person. I've never had anyone explain either one to me that didn't sound like flip sides of the same coin. You're trying to sell mm-hmm. me a bill of goods on your beliefs. I mean, me, it's real simple. Your faith, keep to yourself, share it with people of, of, of a like mind. I don't care if you have your places where you worship, but keep it out of our laws and keep it out of my life. And we're fine. And the problem is most of the major religions don't lend themselves to keeping that out of people's lives. It's one thing I'll give I'll give up for the Jews. The Jews don't go around trying to convert people. <laughs> right, yeah. 
I mean, in fact, you know, I, I don't know. They're, they're more this, like a Trump country club. They're like, <laughs> yeah. like, we'll let you know. You'll you'll know when it's time. But I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm we're not looking strict- to recruit. <laughs> I'm going strictly off of what I've heard, so this might be bullshit. But, in fact, I've heard stories that supposedly if you go to a rabbi and say, I want to convert to Judaism, they'll turn you away a few times to see if you're serious. They're like, hey, right. this is like Fight is- Club. They'll make you sleep on the porch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, which, I mean, you know, if that's the case, it's like, well, at least they want the diehards. I'll give them that. I mean, they found a way to weed them out. Right, uh, they're not just looking for numbers like it seems like most other religious organizations are. They just want bodies so they can seem like more of a presence. It's and like have more power. It, I just remember uh, uh, Jews Gunnery already Sarge- have the power. <laughs> I just remember Gunnery Sergeant Dispro when I walked into the recruiting station for the Marines, and he sat me and a bunch of other people who showed up that day down, and he was like, "The Marines are looking for a few good men. Unfortunately, you ain't it." And I was like, damn, that's a hell of a sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> and there was literally people that I never saw again after that day. And, I mean, I guess he accomplished right. what he wanted to. Hey, if you don't well, want to be here, we don't want you here. Yeah, it makes a person look inside and they either say, he's right, or fuck that shit. I'm going to prove him wrong. So it either you know gets the drive out of you or or weeds out the... The bad seeds, but yeah, I mean, I, but, you know, I, Rich, it's 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 hard because religion does serve a purpose, but religion run amok unchecked, like anything else run amok and unchecked, is just as destructive as everything it, it preaches against. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't I don't want total anarchy, but I don't want the government telling me what I literally I have to eat every morning, and you know I have to take a government approved route to work. And I have to file a paperwork if I want to, you know, take a different route, et cetera, et cetera. I don't. I, there's there's no reason for these two extremes, and for people to say these are our only choices. And it, with religion, right. it's, it, the nature of it is extremes. Because I mean, you talk to you talk to some people in my family; they'll say that religious. The, oh, these these young Christians these days, they're not real Christians. You ask them about hell, and they go, "Well, it's it's just a concept. It's more of a." Uh, of a, a, a cautionary tale in the Bible, you know, hell's not a real place that you go to. That's not what that Bible says. Well, which one are you referring to? Which version are you referring to that's been revised countless times? Because I, I mean, if, if you've, oh, I have family members that are literally like King James version. It's the only version of the Bible. Anything besides King James version is is is, is garbage. Okay, well, what about the versions of the Bible before King James had it rewritten? What about that? They don't want to mm-hmm. talk about it. They just, mm, that doesn't right. matter. It doesn't matter. This is the text you base your entire life on. Seems to me that's rather important. <laughs> I mean, don't you want to do a little fact checking? So, I don't know. I, well, you know, for for myself, uh, when it, I've never had any kind of religion. I've, you know, it's it's not about. The fact that it is an abstract concept that that turns me off because clearly I I have the capability to take abstract concepts and believe them fully. I mean, I I believe that you know the abstract concept of this country and our economy and money are all things that I definitely believe in and. I believe in them because I see the results. I'm a pragmatist. You know, I I live in a society where, well, I mean, shit, just right here in my bedroom, sitting in front of two computers, three keyboards, two guitars, a couple amps. I have actually two iPads now. <laughs> I don't know why I need two. God, they uh, need more phone. electronics than a KISS concert. Shit. <laughs> right. I mean, like, I'm surrounded by all this technology. I'm also surrounded by books and comic books and all these things that that I love. That if I didn't... If, if not just me, if, if humans didn't have the ability to think in abstract concepts and believe them to be real, we never would have accomplished any of this shit. I'd be a part of some random tribe of 150 people. And, you know, you could argue all day long about 
how what my quality of life would be. I mean, maybe not knowing that any of this stuff could ever exist uh, would would lead to a happier life ultimately. Who can say? But I believe in these systems because I've seen the things that they can produce and the wonders that we've accomplished as a, as a human race. And I love that shit. And it's it's not about not having the ability to believe in God or not even necessarily about no proof in God or any kind of higher power or necessarily anything supernatural. It's just the fact that I don't, being a pragmatist, I don't see what it does for me. What does being part of your organization do for me? I don't have these uneasy feelings, these fears that need to be quelled in me. And I'm not saying that makes me like different or special. It's just like everybody's different. Everybody has different needs in their lives. I just don't need religion. It doesn't do anything for me. And it, uh, listening to, I'm a, as much as uh, I, he drives me nuts with his opinion sometimes, I'm an avid listener of Adam Carolla because I grew up with him and I find him to be very funny and very entertaining even when he's dead wrong. He's also an atheist, as he describes, but he was asked by Dennis Brager recently if... He said, okay, so if you don't believe in God, but do you hope there is one? When you die, do you hope that there's a heaven that you can go to, that there's a, an afterlife? And, and he said, yeah, absolutely I do. And I'm not even there. Like, <laughs> I, I don't even hope, I don't even see the point in hoping on there being an afterlife or a God or, you know, or, or any of that stuff. Because, again, what does that mean to me here now in my life? You know, I, I, don't, I don't feel like I need that direction in order to be a good person. You know, I don't, I don't feel like I need the threat of a horrible afterlife hovering over me in order to not fuck over people or or do anything to to hurt anybody else. I, I don't do that because I believe in the abstract concept of the society that we live in and that it only works when we're all working together. <coughs> so, I don't know. I mean, ultimately, maybe you could say that I'm just a, a selfish person, but that, yeah, but a selfish uh, person wouldn't a selfish person wouldn't put such importance on society and working together. A selfish person would be more of what can I, how can I exploit the situation to get what I want out of it, and not care right. about what happens. Well, you could say that you know, as much as I, I don't worship any particular god, I still worship and believe just as much as in science and technology and all this. So. If you watch, uh, well, you could watch the the series American Gods, or you could read read the original book, or there's even a comic book version out. Um, I've done all three, uh, but the the series is really exceptionally well done, and I and it holds very true to the original text, and it may even boil down the the points of Neil Gaiman's story finer than he could himself, I, I hate to say, as much as I'm a fan of his writing. And the story behind American Gods is there's old gods and there's new gods, and the new gods are taken over. And the new gods aren't really that specific. Like, the old gods are fucking Odin and Jesus and, uh, you know... Any, just take your pick, Aries, any, any one of the multitude of, of gods that we've imagined over, over generations of humans. The new gods are concepts of technology and information and entertainment and 
you know, they're, they're still the same abstract concepts. I mean, I, I guess that's another reason why I can't necessarily call myself atheistic. I mean, I have... I don't have religion in the way that most people think of about it, but I, you know, I'm definitely a firm believer in my own abstract concepts. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I know I'm. I, no, no, I keep I, abstracting I, this more and more, where I feel like I don't. Even, I'm not even making sense anymore. That I just sound like some hippy dippy guy. No, you, <laughs> you're you're making sense. But um, to borrow a phrase from uh, one of, I think, one of the most underrated movies of the 90s, Defending Your Life, uh, I think you're getting lost in inner workings of your own mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it happens. And it, I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's just, it can be hard. It can be hard to, it's something I can, and I'm sure that anybody listening, you yourself, can relate to this sometimes you can think of something so clearly but it, to articulate it as clear as you can think of it is a problem and it's not because you don't have the vocabulary for it or whatever it's just you have such a clear picture of it in your mind and you try to explain it and you sit there and you go wait a minute i sound like i'm talking in circles right. here that's not what well, i right because you, know. you are because you're thinking in circles because your your brain is trying to analyze your brain it's like the, okay the concept of uh I, Neil deGrasse Tyson was asked if if a computer if there could be a, a computer powerful enough to simulate our universe you know it, it, it's expanding on this concept that you know our universe is maybe just a, a projection uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the idea of a holographic universe that oh, we're yeah. only like uh, like a facet of of what exists out there and we're just a we're just a projection of that uh, a simulation almost and he said well yeah you know you you could make a computer that is big enough to simulate the universe the only problem is that computer would have to be as big as the universe in order to simulate it <laughs> so it, it almost kind of begs the question like what it what does it really mean to be a simulation but I kind of think of it in the same way. Like, yeah, you know, it, we can't we can't fully understand our brains because we can't think outside of our brains, right? <laughs> so, ultimately, any kind of of introspection is cyclical. It will just ultimately feed back on itself. Well, I, yeah, and the. Yeah, the uh I like that. That it, it, well, the computer would have to be the size of the universe, so we need a really big holodeck to do that, basically. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, or we are the holodeck. <laughs> We're well, in it now. <laughs> this kind of leads to something. That I don't think we've ever really. I mean, maybe you've had this discussion on the Weedsman, but I don't think we've ever really had like a discussion about mind expansion on this show. And it, and it kind of mm -hmm. I. As we're talking about this, like, I mean, Bill Hicks obviously was a comedian, so a lot of people go, whatever, you know, he's a comedian, don't take a comedian seriously. But the best comedians make you laugh and make you think. And yeah. Bill Hicks said something one time that when I, and I heard him, and I was probably 13 when I heard him say this in, a, in one of his bits, it made a whole lot of sense to me. And he said that basically he believes that there are certain a bit, now, I have to preface this by saying that Bill Hicks believed in some sort of higher power. Um, I don't, not, not the Christian God or any God that, you know, is in any of the major religions. But he did definitely believed in a higher power. And he, and his ex said, I believe that God left certain things on this planet to help speed up our evolution. Now, take the God out of it, and I mean, I, I, I think we do ourselves a disservice as a, a race of, of beings by not by, by automatically looking at stuff like mushrooms and marijuana and any other naturally occurring substance and dismissing it as, okay, well, this is what skeevy stoners use and burnouts instead of looking at it like taking in the, taking in the proper dosage 
in the proper setting, it can it can give open up new pathways in your mind to think about subjects that you've never went down before. Because we get so stuck in our way of thinking that that road is just well worn, and it's it's easy. We know where it goes because we take it every day. And right. Right. I mean, it's it's why any kind of uh, mind altering drug is vilified by governments and religion is because it does make them think in in abstract ways outside of those uh, safe abstract concepts of government and religion. It's not about saving. I mean, look, can you do dumb shit when you're tripping balls on on mushrooms or acid? Yeah, it, it does happen. Sometimes people take too much or they can't handle it, or you just have a bad trip. And it has happened that people hurt themselves or do sometimes permanent brain damage. Not brain damage, but maybe just personality damage. But most most people the overwhelming majority of people come out the other side of any kind of mind-altering drug just fine and with a little bit more perspective. And I don't see how that can be bad. Exactly. And it's just like, it's just like when, like with things like separate uh, sensory deprivation tanks. I mean, basically to me that those things are an aid to help people get out of their own fucking mind and get out of their own way. And it's almost like, okay, I know I have a few friends who practice meditation who are not spiritual whatsoever. And I'm like, well, how, you know, and growing up, my mom was, you know, my mom declared herself a psychic at a certain age and read tarot cards and did astrology and all that. So she believed in all that. So meditation was a different thing for her. This was just, I couldn't understand the concept of meditating without having the spiritual connection to it. Well, what's the point? And they were like, just to quiet your mind to where you can be at peace in a moment without having constant stimulation. And I was like, damn, I never thought of that. Because in our society, especially these days, we're constantly stimulated. I mean, we, we, we live in the age of the smartphone where you sit in a doctor's office you don't even read the magazines. You pull out your phone, you start, you know, finger fucking it and looking for shit on, you know, Facebook or Twitter or whatever the fuck. And we don't really have those quiet moments where you just, uh, and just are comfortable with your own thoughts. I mean, I, there was a, a poll that come out that said, would, you know, would you rather, and I, I'm, I'm really going to fuck up the parameters of the poll, but it was something like, would you rather, lose all your technology or like lose a finger and lose your technology was like for a, like a 30 days or something like that and a lot of people came back with uh, take a pinky uh-huh. I'd rather that than lose my technology well, and, if the and, choice was between that and, and I mean losing technology forever and losing a pinky I, yeah take the pinky because I, oh, I yeah, do too yeah. much with it but, but 30 days yeah I'd be like okay yeah take a break and you know p- part of the, the poll was follow up questions and it was I couldn't imagine just sitting in a room without television or music or the internet or my smartphone for 30 days I would go nuts and I think people shortchange themselves when they say that I think people would do. I think most people would go okay there's no, t- there's no TV, there's no internet there's no smartphone, let me go pick up a book let me go pick up an, uh, my instrument that's been sitting in a corner collecting dust. That's what I was just going to say. You know, and I, I've always I'm I need constant stimulation. I understand that. I've always been like this. Um, you know, I I'm not the type where I'm I'm like rude with my smartphone. If I go out to lunch with some coworkers or something, I leave it in my pocket. I don't need to you know look at Twitter the whole time. But. Uh, you know, there's a reason why I, I will do lots of things. I mean, I'm always, if I've got downtime, I'm looking up something on my phone or I'm just like hitting the vaporizer or something. You know, I've always got to be doing something. But before all this technology, I was going everywhere with the book. Mm-hmm. 
when I was a, when I was a kid, I wouldn't not leave the house without having a book on me because there'd be some point where, you know, a car trip somewhere or or whatever it was where I didn't have any direct stimulus and that's when I would you know crack it open. Definitely, I used to, but even and this isn't that long ago because I'm. I'm new to the whole world of tablets and, and, and all that and being able to have like you know a library on a, on a, on a, on a, on a little tablet. I used mm-hmm. to keep books in my car in a little pouch that's you know most cars have behind the seats right and every once in a while you know I'd have to especially in the band days have to you know give people rides to and from places and people would go, why do you have books in your car? I'm like, why wouldn't you? What happens if you get somewhere and you got to wait for a long period of time, and there's nothing, there's nothing to do? Wouldn't you right. rather have something to read? And what I wasn't taking into consideration is, people that said that are most likely not the type of people that are going to sit down and read books. So <laughs> well, <laughs> that wasn't, right. that wasn't in their makeup thing. in the first place. So Th- this idea, though, that's why I constantly fight this idea that technology is making us certain ways. You know that technology is making us dumber or more impatient or whatever. I mean, like, no, look, that, that's, it might, it might be a way to exaggerate our nature, but it's not controlling us in that way. I mean, the person who spends all day on Twitter, you know, just posting dumb shit about themselves or, you know, sharing silly pictures. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of that shit, but if that's where all their time and energy is going, if Twitter didn't exist, all their time and energy would be going into something equally as banal. You know, it's not like the smartphones are going to go away and everybody's going to pick up a book. They're going to go back to reading the National Enquirer at the line in the supermarket. Yeah, and you know, that's one that I've never thought about that way as far as kind of resisting the cliche of, you know, oh, technology is making us X. Because really, it's, you're right. And I, I mean, thank you, because I, I, you put it in a way that made me think about it differently. It's like saying, if you have 24-hour liquor stores, it's going to make you an alcoholic. No, it's just giving you the yeah. ability to go drink 24-7. Most people right. aren't going to take that up. They're not going to go. Oh shit! Twenty-four hour drinking law. <laughs> it's leaving Las Vegas time. I mean, it's it, most people aren't going to do that. It's just it gives the option, and just like anything else, some people are going to go overboard with it to their own detriment, and some people are going to go. That's nice, but I can drive past every liquor store that's open twenty-four-seven the rest of my life and never set foot in one. Right. I yeah because yeah I I think that's that's really that's a, a very big part of the. It, it's, it's it's not a good it's not a good look for our generation because we we tend to especially about our kids oh my god their face is always in you know their smartphone or a tablet mm-hmm. or something well I mean at a certain point it's you're bitching in the same fashion about different things and you're basically bitching about semantics at a certain point because were not wasn't wasn't it oh my god every time they come home from school their face is in that Nintendo. They're playing The Legend of Zelda or Mario or whatever the fuck. I mean, you can... I, I had friends, and I had friends that didn't play video games. I had friends that played role-playing games. And when I say they played role-playing games, it was every day. Like some Stranger Things shit. I mean, it was like campaigns right. that went on yeah. for months. And, you know, their parents were like, oh, they're fucking weirdo. My kid just sits there in his basement with his friends rolling dice and, and fighting imaginary dragons and shit and blah, 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 blah. Well, I... I is it is it a good thing to become obsessed with stuff like that? No, but is it better than any of the million self destructive things you could do to pass the time? Yeah, right. Well, yeah. When it comes to my kids, I mean they're they're all teched out as well. They they're spoiled and not well. I I attribute uh, some some of that spoilage myself, but. I well, some of the things that I've gotten recently from my kids. Uh, all three of us. Well, actually, we we all three of us had DSs until one of them broke, and now me and my daughter are kind of sharing one DS, which is fine. I, 
I really mostly play it with them anyway. But the the DSs were purchased because it was something that we could play together. And that was a big reason why, you know, in, when the uh, my son had a, had a DS for a while and he would play games on it, but mostly he would look for other friends who had games that he could play with online or other people that he could play with online. And that's a big reason why he wanted his sister to have a DS and he wanted me to have DS. He wanted to play these games with us. And I was like, okay, let's do this. And for my daughter's birthday last month, I bought her a laptop. She uh, just turned 11 and she has her own fucking laptop. Does she need a laptop? I mean, her, her mother argued with me over this. She doesn't need it. You already got her a phone. I'm like, well, yeah, the phone is so I could talk to her. The phone is so I could send her messages and, you know, because she doesn't live with me, I could keep a line of communication open. And and that's a lot of that is done with just like, you know, here's a stupid picture of a of a cat. You know. <laughs> but it but it's something. It's a line of communication. And uh you know, d- does she does she really need the laptop? Well, most of what she does with the laptop is play Minecraft. That's like ninety percent of what she does with that, and I'm perfectly okay with that because she plays Minecraft online with her friends and with her brother. You know, my kids have their do they have their noses and devices a lot? Yeah, fuck yeah, they do, but they're it's not like they're not communicating you know I mean I had my nose in a book most of the time as uh, as a kid and I wasn't communicating you know I yeah, I didn't make I've I didn't I've never really made a lot of friends I'm not great at, at 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 going out and making friends and usually if I have a few that I, I feel I can trust that's all I need you know Aaron Mr. Personality you you don't have <laughs> you don't have a you have a hard time making friends you mean you, you can't just walk up to a stranger at a bar and be like hey can I buy you a drink and by the way can't are you as excited about the singularity as I am? <laughs> <laughs> I figured that's the best. That's the best opening line I've ever heard. <laughs> well, no, okay, but right. So, but my point is, is that you know they are. This is part of their socialization, exactly. and by I, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be restrictions on this on technology. But by putting these extreme restrictions where, like, my kids only get online an hour a day or they only have X amount of of screen time a week, I'm like, dude, this is part of the new world, okay? Do you want your kids to be socialized and be able to work in the new society that they are creating? Well, then you're gonna, they're going to have to know this technology because that is how people are communicating. Exactly. And yeah, it's only Minecraft and and you know stupid games like that. But that's how they're doing it. Well, is it any you know, different? It, it, is you playing having a DS and your kids having a DS and you guys playing together any different? Really, when you go to get it down to its to its base ingredient, than if you took your kid outside and played catch with them? Right. No, exactly. It's not. But but no, playing catch is wholesome because it's a tradition. Like, what the fuck ever? My kids don't get... I mean, my son follows some sport, but uh, or some are... I don't know which ones. But he has never shown any interest in in playing sports himself. But like, society is supposed to press on me that like, if I'm going to be a good dad, I have to take him out and play catch with him. Why? So we can both be bored in which we were playing video games instead? <laughs> <laughs> it's about it's about what you do together. I mean, some of the some of the the, the best times I remember as a kid with my dad was there was a game called Bases Loaded for the Nintendo, and mm-hmm. I, I someone bought it for me. It's just like a it was like a clearance item that was on sale at one point, and it turned out that I really liked this game and. 
I, dad came home from work early one day and saw me playing it and he's like oh a baseball game and then he was he only sat down and he started watching it and he's like this actually looks pretty cool can I try and we ended up what we ended up doing was we would play games and he would pitch I would bat next next game I'd pitch and he'd go to you know he'd he'd bat and I mean it's just that to me that was you know and we'd laugh and and you know get mad when they, you know the, the, oh, the computer's cheating you know what I'm saying like, like right, right. everybody yeah. does with video games you know and I look back on that and that was a much better time because my dad was not into sports whatsoever then when I was in Little League and I was like hey dad can you play catch with me and you could almost see in a millisecond like 10 minutes of okay do I tell this boy that I hate playing catch is it going to fuck up my relationship with him or do I just go out there and fucking suck it up and play catch and then he just <sighs> okay let's go and I was like, "All right," but I knew he was miserable. So I mean, mm. I look back on that, and I, we we had we had better times sitting there because he collected comic books too. I mean, well into adulthood, and I, I, we had better times sitting there playing video games together, talking about comic books. You know, I mean, and it, it, in a way, it was like two kids because we'd go, "Well, who would whip who's ass, Superman or the Hulk?" You know, and stuff like that. Right. But I look back on it and I cherish that because I don't have that with my mom. My mom and me had no, she had no interest in anything I did and I had no interest in anything she did. We literally existed around each other. We didn't share a life when we went, or, or, or share life together when I was a kid. It was, you're here until the law says I can throw you out and I have to take care of you. And even she did that intermittently. My father was like, you enjoy this, I enjoy this, let's enjoy it together. And I mean, yeah, I, he, so for someone to go, oh, you're not taking your kid out and playing catch, well, playing video games with them, that's no good. How many how many parents take their kids out and play catch with them are going to have kids that grow up and end up in baseball, you know, playing professionally? Like, what is it, 0.1%? Mm -hmm. So what, what, right. what the, it, ultimately, if we're talking as far as, okay, you get a little bit of physical exercise, but it's still a futile wait, time waster. But it's not about that. It's about hopefully your kids, when they get older, and when you're, you know, and, and after you're gone, will look back and go, damn, I had a dad who was willing to, you know, sit there and play video games with me, and, you know, we had a good time, whatever. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine, I would be tickled as, uh, like, a pig in shit if I was a kid these days. And my parents were split, and my dad would send me cat memes in text. I'd be right. like, you know, or, or stupid pictures or something like that. I'd be like, God damn, he actually is thinking about me when I'm not there. Right. Like, that's, that's, that's something that... that it, that's something that gets lost in the technology is, is isolating us. And it's also letting us... If we choose to use it to let people know, hey, look, just because you're not in a room with me doesn't mean I don't, you know, I stop thinking about you. Mm -hmm. And that's important. That's important for kids to have. I mean, it, that's, that well, is. Well, yeah, but. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I, no, I was just going to say, because, you know, to the, to the bigger point of uh, this concept that technology is isolating us, um, even on, uh, if you look at the the political aspect of that, how everybody is living in their own little bubbles, even though everybody's on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, they still only talk to and share stories with people who share their beliefs already. And that's just, again, that's just human behavior. Like, it, it's easier for us to now see how much everybody's in their own little bubble when it comes to their beliefs because they're putting those beliefs and thoughts out on the internet where most of it stays forever it, you know so it, it's easier to see that but Twitter didn't create the, that bubble the media didn't create that bubble I mean it, it wasn't even considered a bubble in the past it was just you know 
it was you were able to live in in your own little world because your world was a, kind of your own little world. You had your neighborhood, your neighbors, and whatever that you would uh, in, in your family that you would talk to about your beliefs and your ideas, and and that was its own little bubble. But you didn't, you know, print your conversations in the newspaper for people across the world to read. Well, that's essentially all we're doing now. We're putting all of our thoughts out there for everyone to read so we can all see how fucked up each other are. But it hasn't changed us. Facebook didn't create this environment where where people can uh, have a, a basically a feedback loop of, of sharing stories and, and beliefs and ideas and never hearing new ideas or from people outside that bubble. I mean... It's it's just laid it out for us to see clearly how how isolated we can really make ourselves. Well, I, it, yeah, and people tend to, for whatever reason, want to assign a good or bad tag onto things. And I think that things like Twitter, Facebook, none of these things were created to be good or bad. I mean, it, right, right. at best they were at best they were created because someone said, "I wonder if I can do this," and at worst they're amoral. They just don't care. It's not like there's intent behind it. Most technology is it, it, it is not it. Most technology was created by people either trying to make their life a little bit easier, or hey, can I do this? I don't know. Let me try. And then when people get hold of it, right. that's when. What they do with it turns it into well, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I, there's people. I, there's people. I'm friends with people on Facebook who are just relentlessly positive, and just like morning people, they tend to get on my fucking nerves. But I, I yeah. But I, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like it's a picture like, of a yeah. Waterfall. You have to tweet good morning every fucking morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. We know or, the sun came up, <laughs> or it's constant like pictures of waterfalls and it might as well say some trite inspirational quote whatever right. you know i mean and it's and it, it, it but i part of me is like you know the cynical side of me goes okay who are you trying to convince us or yourself that you're this positive but then another part of me is like you know what that person's at least going yeah i know i could go into the comment sections and get down and dirty and do all the arguing and, and, and go back and forth but i'm choosing not to and it's kind of if you think about it it's a way of weeding people out because people looking to start shit aren't going to show up on someone's page who's not going to go back and forth with them right and if someone sees all this like you know positive affirmations type shit on someone's page it's like yeah this person's probably not a good good opponent to start an argument with and they're going to move on but I, I still I mean like once again it's, it's still kind of annoying it's like you know we get it you know you, you woke up this morning and you're so grateful I understand every day is a gift but some days it just sucks okay stop stop celebrating <laughs> that <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> not every day you're getting a fucking Corvette okay calm down uh, but oh shit! I was gonna. Uh, oh fuck! I completely lost it. I was gonna double back on one of your points about the uh, 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 the technology with your kids and everything, but it was right there and tipped my tongue. I went to go say it, and my mind went, "Hey, check this out!" and just shut off. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> happens. It happens more and more as I get older, and it's starting to scare me because all Alzheimer's does run in my family. <laughs> oh yeah, man, that's scary shit. Hey, you know, we, while we've been getting continually more and more abstract, and we kind of skipped over a lot of the more concrete things that we we thought we were going to talk about. I don't know if you want to get back into any of that shit. Um, yeah. Um, well, the, the Carrie Fisher's autopsy come out, and yeah, very interesting. That, um, come out that uh, there was cocaine. MDMA, uh, heroin, and basically uh, other opiates in her system. Yeah, yeah trace amounts, uh, whatever that means. I mean, I, I don't know. You can't t 
test somebody for cocaine and tell me that oh well they did an eight ball a week ago you know yeah well i mean well, it doesn't op- even stay in your system that long opiates but. tend to stay in your system the longest um yeah so i mean but even the coroner was like we can't say if she was on anything by the results but i mean you can you can just from the fact that cocaine is out of your system in 72 hours give or take you can pretty much make a safe assumption that in the last three days she'd you know toot it up you know uh right no, or, I mean, or what, took something i mean took something with cocaine in it which if she had mdma in her system if she took ex quote unquote ecstasy who knows what else was in it so right if she was just taking party drugs they they could be combinations of any number of different drugs in there yeah um i mean and it you know i know that she'd had issues with substance abuse in the past and stuff so i mean that wasn't that wasn't anything like earth shattering. I, yeah. I'm kind of shocked that all of she's, that was in her dope. system because I mean, she was very proof, open. Oh, I mean, it's just proof she was a hard charger even into her fifties. She was like, "I'm not here. <laughs> right. for, I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time." And she meant that <laughs> shit. I mean, that's some that's some Hunter S. Thompson levels of you got some shit in your system. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. I'm kind of against my better judgment. I'm kind of impressed. You know, it's like. I don't even, I'd have hung out with Carrie Fisher. You know, she'd have been a good time. Uh, but what was more interesting is the reactions I saw on social media about it. And a lot of people were posting this meme. I had a, picture, a couple pictures of her, and it said, you know, doesn't matter what was in her system. Everybody goes through rough times, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Appreciate her for her work. Not what she, you know, this and that. But it was really, I, I can't, I, 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 I've been trying to find it, and I can't. And I've seen, like, five people post it. And, of course, when I go looking for it, I can't find it. So I wanted to read it verbatim. But it's not that necessarily it says, you know, hey, look, it was her life, and she was doing what she wanted with it. It's none of your business. I agree with that. It was more right. of a, like, a scolding of the public because, you know, well, it doesn't matter what she died of doesn't matter blah 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 and there's a part of me that's like "Eh, i'm not really cool with that outlook because there's certain things that if you are a partier you have to accept or you're going to have to understand you're going to die an unnaturally uh accelerated death and yeah to me cocaine has a has an expiration date Heroin. I've only known a handful of people who's, who've claimed to have experimented with heroin that were that were never strung out. So to me, the odds on that that's not a, that's not a recreational drug for most people. I mean, maybe some people it is. I don't know. Like I said, it's just a handful of people that say, "Oh, I've actually shot up and I would was fine the next day and never touched it again." No, no, I never shot up, but uh, toot a little brown here and there. Yeah, see, I've, I've never even done a bump of it. I mean, that I know of. I mean, I've taken so many pills, God knows what the fuck was in there. But Right, yeah. Um, it, and th- th- to me, it speaks to this, you know, don't judge people. And it's like, it's not judging. It's learning from not necessarily even mistakes. It's learning from life choices other people have made. And... To sit there and say that it doesn't matter, and if you care at all, that you know you're you're part of the problem, and it was like it was just it went from what I thought was going to be, hey, celebrate her work, appreciate her for what you know what she did that that you know brought you mm-hmm. happiness, and leave her leave her be because you know her family's grieving. It went from what I thought it was going to be that into like I said into a very much a scolding like we're children. Whoever wrote this. It was like a parent talking to a child for getting caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Right. And I just, I don't understand, like, the... It, I mean, it almost look, sounds like they, they're trying to say that she was, what you want to, that Carrie Fisher was perfect how she was, and you should just accept her as that. And anything less than that is being judgmental when... I think if you if Carrie Fisher were still alive, she would say, ah, "I'm pretty far from fucking perfect." Exactly. And she, she was pretty pretty um, open and honest about how fucked up her life was, and 
I don't think anybody would plan out that life for themselves. Exactly. And I mean, to, to, to just completely say it's this subject is off the table, anybody who discusses it is a piece of shit, anybody who ponders it's a piece of shit. No, it's a to valid me. conversation. Like, why did she feel the need to even in her 50s to be doing drugs that regularly? I mean, maybe it was a fluke. Maybe she's like, oh, yeah, the, the one time in 10 years that I do a little drugs at a party and I die three days later. <laughs> but <laughs> chances are probably not. That's not yeah. how it happened. So, 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 I mean, isn't it a valid conversation to say, why? Why were drugs so important to her? Why was altering herself constantly? I mean, look, again, I'm not being judgmental about anybody who does any kind of drugs, but like I'm I'm only in my 40s now and I, like I don't touch anything other than the weed. I don't need to. Well, see, you know, and, and if I was if I was going out and doing ecstasy and snorting coke on the weekends, I Hopefully, if I wasn't looking at my life, somebody else would be like, hey, what are you doing? Maybe you should slow down a little bit. And maybe there's some deeper problems going on here that you're running away from. Exactly. Because And maybe that's yeah. what it was about with Carrie Fisher. Maybe that's the, the silver lining that we, that we should be taking from analyzing her life and death is that, look, she, she had fucked up problems and uh, and a lot of the only... It seemed like the only way that she had to deal with the, those problems were drugs, and maybe that should speak to how we handle just mental illness in general. Well, yeah, and that's, as a society, that's, that's basically what what really <laughs> triggered me it was okay. So wait a minute, if we're not allowed to talk about it, then the issues that caused her to be a person in her I'm a i am I mean, I, I don't remember how old she was. She had to be in her fifties, had to be, and probably in her late yeah. 50s. Yeah. I mean, for a person to have that mixture in their system, and I mean, like, if she'd have died and have been like, we found traces of weed, I'd have been like, okay, did you also find that she ate last night? That's no big deal. I mean, that's it fucking weed's weed. Right. You did know, you find I mean, oxygen in her blood? <laughs> shocking, you know? I mean, but, <laughs> but it is, it is. It, it closes the door on having an honest and real discussion about addiction and the causes of it which is a mental health issue and does get glossed over and it gets glossed over by 12-step programs by going you're an addict and it's a disease and you're not responsible for it but you are responsible for handling your disease okay well, what's the cure for this disease well these 12 steps which half of them are about basically praying away your disease okay i don't know any disease that you get rid of by praying so right there, to me, that's not a healthy way to go about looking at it. A and the people who go, oh, if you do drugs <laughs> like our attorney general, then you're a scumbag and you're the scum of the earth if you smoke weed and you need to go to prison for a long, long time. Yeah. That's what happens when we don't have a nuanced conversation about this stuff, is you get those two extremes and ideas. And... Neither of them are helping the addicts. They're, what they're doing is they're making the people who say this stuff to them feel better about themselves because there, I said my piece. I have a stance on it. I'm a hardliner against drugs. There, I'm helping them, whether they want that help or not. Or, hey, look, it's not your fault you have a disease. There's no, I mean, there's no doubt, scientifically, you can have a predisposition to alcoholism and drug use. That's been proven. I mean, they've done CAT scans and, and studies of the brain. Different parts of the brain in those people react differently to drugs than a person who doesn't have that. Right. So in that sense, yes, it might be a neurological disorder or a, chem or, or a chemical disorder. Your body reacts to that chemical differently than the quote-unquote normal person. But that's still, we're completely dismissing the conversation of why did they pick up in the first place. And why did they keep going back to it? I mean, and that's something that, that is, to me, to get over addiction <clears throat> on a personal level. I don't Because we're never going to stop addiction. Addiction's always going to be there. People are always going to want to get high. And there's going to be people who are going to take it to the extreme and end up in the grave because of it or dead. 
And there's just nothing we can do about that. That's just collateral damage because of life. That's all there is to it. But when a person goes, I'm doing too much of, of, of this and it's fucking up my life, we need to be able to sit down and have a conversation and go, okay, what's, what's causing this? What are you trying to get away from? Because one of the things that, that I found out about myself, drinking, a lot of my drinking was, when I was younger, I was bored. And it's a way to kill time. I don't have to work tomorrow. I ain't got nothing going on tonight. I'll get fucked up and get drunk. Well, yeah. that, that became such a staple of my life that when I did hit the hard times... And I and and you know started seeing the the <laughs> bottom coming up at me. I started drinking to forget shit that I couldn't stop thinking about. And the irony of it is, once I got to the point of being drunk, all I could think about was what I was trying to get away from. <laughs> and now I'm drunk, so the, we all know that's when your best ideas pop in your head. That's yeah. when <laughs> that that's when the, that's when the three a.m. text to the X start happening, you know, because mm-hmm. um, it seems like a good idea at the time. Um, and, and it wasn't until I sat down and started talking to people and being like, "Yeah, there was shit that I just didn't want to deal with," and a lot of it was I had to either learn to deal with it and change it, or I had to just go. There's nothing I can do to change this. It's in the past. It's happened. All I can do is try to not let it dictate how it's going to continue to make me feel. Now, that doesn't mean forgetting what's happened to a person in the past and that person going, la, 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 it didn't happen, it's done, it's over with. No, it's just accepting that, look, shit happens to people out of their control that fucks with you. And it's perfectly normal when, when something like that happens to have a response to it. It's not normal to become locked in that response constantly, in that state constantly. And, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot more bigger issues there than just that. But, I mean, that was the one thing that I took from it. I'm like, wow, man. Are, is, is that the the next step here as far as, as drugs and abuse of drugs? Not use, abuse of drugs in society. Is that we're, we're, we're going to get to the point where because there's push to legalize marijuana that and, and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, that people are going to go well if we talk about drug use in any negative way it's just going to hurt our cause so let's not talk about it so we're going to label you as judging somebody if you talk about their drug use I, you, you follow what I'm saying like it, it like it's as a way to, to nip the conversation in the bud because yeah. you know or people who are going to go on the, on the polar opposite well see what happens when you do drugs all drugs are bad you do drugs you die I got news for you you never do drugs you still die okay no no one here gets out alive that's not how this works so you know to me when people go oh drugs will kill you life will kill you I what what what, 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 are we going to stop fucking stop you know procreating because everybody dies eventually and that's horrible no and so it's just it irritated me because too many, I think too many people buy into the, the, once again, it's intellectual laziness, the easiness of, oh, if you have a problem, go to a 12-step meeting, listen to what they say, don't question anything. It's not healthy. You right. know, cognitive, cognitive behavior therapy is, is, to me, at this point, in what we know about addiction and how to treat it, the most reasonable way to go about treating it. And that is the, addi- the, the addiction and the addictive behavior is a symptom of, of the actual problem and you got to get to the root of the problem and I mean I it's gonna come off sounding like some touchy-feely shit but it's honest to God's truth because I've actually had people tell me this I've had them say this to me so I know people feel this way there's there could be someone out there who is struggling with something and wants you know some sort of addiction and wants to talk to somebody and they see something like that and they go oh shit well if I bring it up then you know I'm gonna be judged and blah 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 and you know, right. oh, you're just a druggie. And so I, I'm i going to hide it. I mean, that was the one thing that I guess I had going for me is I never hid anything I did from anybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, at one point I had a couple friends who had watched too many episodes of Intervention try to, you know, sit me down and say, well, you're drinking and blah, blah, blah. And instead of dealing with what my drinking was, which I gave them more than enough ammo to do, 
they read me the every cliche they could. You're hiding, you're drinking. And I turned around and I looked and I said, you see these four garbage bags of empty beer cans as you sit here talking to me? Where am I hiding my drinking from you? Like, don't come hey. at me like, a t- like, like what you see on TV. Come at me as me. Let's be honest here. So it's just it's, it's a little bit of a pet peeve. I mean, I, I got some serious rabbit ears for that fucking issue because, you know, it hits close to home. And it hit close, to, not just for me, but, you know, I sat down and thought about it. I've buried seven people I've known due to an overdose in the last six years of my life. Damn. That's, I don't want that to continue. You know, I one of my old bosses I used to work for, he's 54. He's on life support because his liver failed. I mean, he's 54 and he's drank himself to death. And that's, I don't want that for these people. You know, these are people that, that even if I wasn't close friends with, you know, I got along with, I had great conversations with, I had good times with. I don't want to see them go through this shit. And I don't want anyone who doesn't understand what it's like to shut the door on the conversation for them. I understand. If you don't want to be part of the conversation because you don't understand, that's fine. I have no problem. Go away. But don't go away and shut the door behind you and say, no one can enter this room because I say so. Hey, no, dude, you don't get to... That's not, how, that's not how that works. You know, people sometimes need to talk to other people who've been through the same shit. That's why a lot of people who go through addiction, same as people who go through combat and they come out with PTSD they're only comfortable talking to other combat vets. A lot of people who go through addiction have a hard time having a conversation with a therapist who's never been there themselves. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one thing I will give the 12-step program. It's addicts helping addicts. Because who else better to understand what you're going through than someone who's been there themselves? So, Yeah, and it, you know, it's always interesting to me when we talk about some of the major problems that we that we face in this country how much of those issues a lot of it ties back to mental health and you know we we still have this like 1950s mentality of well I always use the example of uh, um, Jack Donaghy from uh, 30 Rock Alec Baldwin's character who he he solves problems by sque- by squeezing them in his mind vice. But basically this idea that you can just compartmentalize everything and it's only the weaker people who, who, who can't handle this shit that, that quote-unquote go crazy or lose their shit. I mean, if you want to... If you're bothered by... I mean, pick, pick your topic. Crime... Homelessness, drug addiction, you know, whatever whatever it is you think that is the, the cancer that's eating away at our society. Even terrorism, you know. Even, you know, as much as, uh, as you uh, can give honest criticism to, uh, to certain religions for, you know, inciting violence in people whether it's in the in the text or not um i think you got to have a little touch of the the mental illness to execute that plan to become oh, a terrorist you know so it it just it never ceases to amaze me that like I mean, we had this whole argument after the shooting in D.C. about what this meant. And people wanted to make it about gun control. And a lot of people wanted to make it about inciting violence through radical language. And there were very few people out there who were just saying, this guy was mentally ill, you know? The, the the problem wasn't that he listened to uh, left, extreme left-wing liberals. It's that he believed that he was the answer to the problem. And that, I mean, to, to think that the... To think that, first of all, just randomly shooting senators is going to solve anything, especially as one person, you got to be fucking mentally ill. <laughs> But 
yeah, I mean, I, I just, I don't get it. I don't understand why. I mean, we almost, uh, one of the first, uh, you could say, like, viral TV shows, uh, one that, you know, The Sopranos is a, the, the show that I'm talking about, the show that seemed to cross over for everyone, you know. I mean, back in the day when we only had three or four channels, everyone was watching the same shit anyway. Yeah. And then event- eventually with hundreds of, of uh, channels of cable, people just found their niche and that was it. And then shows started coming out like Sopranos that crossed over for many people. And everybody was talking about that show. And that's the core concept of, of The Sopranos is mental illness. I mean... Tony Soprano is fucking sick in the head. And he even for himself, for somebody that is this macho, mind vice type of guy who you should just be able... I mean, that's the man's job is to like do the dark shit and tuck it away in a part of his brain where you can forget about it and go on and, and do what needs to be done. And, and even he as a, as a character came around to the idea that, that he needed this therapy that this is so i mean he didn't solve his issues but at least he was attempting to and i thought maybe that that would help change the idea of 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 how we handle mental illness but it still doesn't we we ultimately because we prize i I think as a country we prize uh self-determination self-responsibility as as this high ideal that that everybody should strive for and and it's a good thing to strive for but when somebody doesn't do that isn't able to accomplish that for themselves because they're just weak and not because they have certain barriers that stop them from being successful well, we even I mean if it, it there's yeah. people in society that go so far as to take a, a, a mental illness they have or an issue, and not necessarily an illness, just an issue they have, and they pretty it up with soft language and turn it into like a lifestyle option. I mean, I yeah. have, a, and this is something that I'm going to come off as hypocritical, but, you know, being as overweight as I am, I... I, here's here's how I look at it. If I was healthy at this weight, I wouldn't give a fuck that I'm overweight. I have a real issue with not giving a fuck what most people think. My issue is it's not healthy for me to be this weight. Now, if I think that's a that's a pretty rational and logical way to look at being overweight. When I see someone who's my size or bigger walking around talking about I'm beautiful at any size. And I'm healthy, even though I'm fat. I'm like, no, you're not. And just and by the way, I hate to bring this. I mean, the, the beauty thing is subjective. It's the healthy thing that really gets to me. Because just because you're 20 and 400 pounds and you don't have an issue now, in 20 years you're going to. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when at that point. Right. And as I get older, and my friends are coming down with diabetes high blood pressure, you know, other ser- more serious disorders due to their lack of being healthy, I bristle even more and more at people who are sitting there at 20 years old, you know, uh, I'm sorry, a five foot two woman who's 350 pounds telling me she's healthy, you're not. I'm sorry. And whoever's telling you that is lying to you. And the first thing you should do is put your hand over your wallet and back away from them because they're trying to get something from you. Is what it, 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 it to me, it's like when a preacher comes up being nice. I put my hand over my wall and back away slowly. Like, mm-mm, right. I don't trust you. What, what do you want? You know, so that's but, my you problem. Know, you know, I mean, and par- people have all different issues because, you know, some people eat for comfort. Some people eat uh, depression. And those are things that we, if we could have an honest conversation about, we could deal with on a realistic level. And you don't have right. to go, you're a fat, disgusting pig, and shame them for it. You go, look, you have some behaviors that you have to change, and they're so deeply ingrained, it's going to be hard. 
I mean, when I have a doctor tell me, have you thought about getting, what is it, the, the lap band or whatever? I look at him and I go, can I just go on a diet? And she, the last doctor I said it to, she looked at me and she raised her eyebrows and she goes, I don't know, can you? <laughs> she goes, I'm just, look, you're 40. You, you, you keep this up, you probably won't make 55, 60. I'm trying to help you right now. Because every day that you're, you stay at this weight, you're one day closer to it being too late to come back from the brink. And I was like, oh, kind of like when a doctor told me, like, yeah, we just looked at your liver enzymes. If you keep drinking, you'll be dead within three years. I'm not going to sit here and tell you twice. I'm going to go try to help someone who wants to live. You sit here and decide what you want to do. And, I mean, just matter of fact told me that. I was like, oh, okay. I just got a real big double barrel shotgun of reality in my face. And so that's that's my that's right. my issue with people with this soft language and covering things up and going, Oh, it's a lifestyle choice. Maybe I'm being too harsh. And I know I'm being a hypocrite because I'm fat, so <laughs> No, I hear you. I mean I know that that it's uh nobody's supposed to fat shame anyone. But you know, I think maybe the the problem isn't so much that a, a person would ever feel ashamed for being fat. It's the fact that everybody's got an opinion on it. It's kind of like the difference between, well, let's say, let's say you got a bit of a bo problem, and and as you know. A lot of kids go through this. You're a teenager. You start smelling. You don't smell your own funk. Sometimes other people have to tell you. My son's kind of at that age where other people have to be like, hey, yo, you need a little deodorant under your arm. <laughs> See those things growing out your armpit? That, that's just right. that's a flavor saver, okay? That's just making sure that smell stays there. Put something on there. Kill that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, so I mean, like, if your parent or maybe your friend at school kind of leans over and be like, "Hey, you kind of stink today." Okay, you know, that's you're shaming them a little bit. You're saying, "Hey, look, you know, you're doing things that are going to make other people not want to like talk to you and hang out with you." Now, if everybody on the school in the school picks on you because you stink, well. That's not exactly healthy shaming, you know. That's that's kind of more leaning into the scarring territory of things that you don't forget about. Now, well, it's, everybody, it's like, everybody's different. And I was picked on probably as much as anyone was in school, and it certainly didn't scar me. I've always kind of had a "I don't give a fuck" attitude, but 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 I think I. I don't know. Am I making my point well? That like no, you are. You are. There's the idea that it's not always that shaming is a bad thing, or that feeling shame is a bad thing. But when you know, it's everybody's got to have a comment on on uh, on your post about how you're big and beautiful. That just kind of negates any positive effects that you might get from going, hey, maybe you should go on a diet because we want you to be around longer. Well, it's to me, it goes, oh, intent plays a, a large role in it. If someone is coming to me as a friend and going, hey, man, look, like, dude, you, I'm just going to be honest with you, man. You're a bigger dude. It's like 90 out with 100% humidity. Um, you know, I maybe you should, you know, put some more deodorant on or like he, he kind of musty, dude. If that's a friend. Right. I understand what he's saying. The difference is people who just like, oh man, you fucking stink, man. You fucking blah blah blah. They don't. They're not trying to change the behavior. They're just enjoying getting off on telling you that you fucking stink. I mean, it's 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 the whole people who go, I'm brutally honest. Well, people who are who claim to be brutally honest tend to enjoy the brutality, and the honesty is just you know an ancillary benefit. It's 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 almost a eh, you know like I'm not really worried about the honesty. I just want to be brutal to you, for whatever reason. Right. I mean I I mean I look as a bigger guy in the industry I work in, I can I can be in temperatures up to 120 degrees in the dead of winter, and I've worked in some places 
where in the summer we don't they won't run the air conditioner the owner won't let us so you can imagine how hot it gets so before i go to work every day i take a shower throw on clean clothes go to work and i've worked with guys who aren't even close to as big as me who don't do that and i've had to pull them aside and be like look man we work in customer service we're working around food right i understand you might have you might have went a little hard last night didn't get a whole lot of sleep but uh you know i i rather you be 10 minutes late and come in here and not smell like a you know like you've been rolling around not and, and haven't showered in two days because you haven't because you were out partying after you got off work last night then you know for you to be 10 minutes late and come in and you know smell like soap whatever i mean that's and it's a fine line to walk but me, I appreciate it. I, I'm one of those people that if I got a booger hanging out of my nose and I'm talking to you, fucking say something. Right. Don't just sit there and stare at it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, Because eventually I'm going to end the conversation, go somewhere, see my reflection, and go, I sat there with a booger hanging out my fucking nose talking to this person for the last 10 minutes. What kind of <laughs> asshole do I look like? You know. <laughs> I remember uh, spending most of a day at work and uh, towards the end of the day, went and used the bathroom, and my hair was all like fucked up and doing something stupid with like sticking up in the back. And uh, afterward, I came out and I was like to the guys that I was working all day with, like uh, my hair was all fucked up. You guys didn't even say anything, and they're like, "Yeah, it was like that all day." I'm like, well, why the fuck didn't you say something? Why why wouldn't you be like, hey, your, your hair's all fucked up in the back. Why don't you go take care of yourself? I would appreciate that. Well, I don't know. How do we know? Like, maybe you're, that was your style or something. I'm like, oh, so now you th- you're you saying I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> I'm stupid. Like, I, I made some stupid, crazy, fucked up hairstyle where my hair sticks up in the back. And I was going to run with that like it was cool all day. Like, I would expect you to call me on that shit, too. Like, yo, what the fuck's up with your hair? You think that's cool? Yeah, wait, who do you think I am? Russell Brand? I'm going to run around looking like I just, you know, tongue-kissed a light socket? No, I... (laughs) Right. The one one time that it's recent and it sticks out in my memory that really irks me is I had a friend whose parent had died, and this is when I was drinking. And the night before, I, I really tied one on. And that morning I got up and I did not want to go to this memorial service but I felt obligated to because I'm friends with this person and I know they're her entire family and so I threw on my dress shirt dress clothes tie and headed off now for whatever reason my shirt at the bottom wasn't buttoned up and I was wearing a black dress shirt and I had a white t-shirt on underneath and I get to I get there and I don't notice it because I'm so massively hungover and I'm just not focused on I didn't even give myself the you know the double take before I walked out the door in the mirror. I just said, good, let's go. And I won't call this fucking cocksucker a friend. I'll just say he's a person I know who happens to travel in the same circles. Okay. All of a sudden, dipshit walks up to me and this faggot goes, oh, uh, hey man, um, can I get a picture of you? And I'm like, what the fuck do you want a picture of me, dude? We barely talk. I'm like, it's free fucking country, dude. Flips out his phone, he starts taking pictures, and then he's fucking laughing and giggling, showing the picture off to everybody. And I'm like, the fuck? About 30 minutes later, you know, a buddy of mine comes up to me and he goes, uh, did you see what homeboy over there posted? I was like, no. And he showed me, and he's like, you know, oh yeah, Rich. He can't even dress up right. He's such a fucking slob. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, really? What the fuck? I was like, dude, you're a fucking faggot, bro. You're an asshole of the highest fucking order, man. Seriously. Like, I basically, my friend was like, dude, this isn't the time nor place. This is a memorial service. I'm like, no, I got you. I got you. But, you know, dude, see, like that type of shit, those, are, those people are assholes. Like, seriously, dude, you couldn't just come over and be like, hey, man, your shirt's fucking undone at the bottom there and your fucking white T-shirt's kind of in stark contrast to your black everything else, so you might want to do something (laughs) about that. You know, no. It's, hey, let's make fun of him. 
And here's the thing. This is the type of dude, if you knew him, he's got, you could fill the Grand Canyon with shit I could goof on him about. But because yeah. of the situation, I wasn't going to, I was like, all right, where we're at, is, it isn't appropriate to go off. But I mean, it's just those type of people, I choose to have as little contact with as I can possibly have. Because I got a bad habit of being a sarcastic asshole to people I like because, and, and I kind of, like, I kind of tease them a little bit, but it's because I like them. But then if right. I don't like you, I'm a sarcastic asshole. So, it, but, it, but the, it's not, it's not, it's no longer teasing. It's just like pure contempt for you. You know, like, right, uh, right. you're breathing my air. Get away from me. You know, like, just serious. <laughs> so, I, you know, I can understand where people get confused sometimes, but it, like th- just those type of people i i have no use for it's like anybody the older i get the more i do this what do you bring to the table and i'm not and not in a, in a in a selfish way like what can you do for me and that's all your value is to me and that's all your worth right. is as a human but what do you bring right. to the table because if you're one of these people who say we're going to do this we're going to do that we're going to do this and you're constantly bailing then you're a bullshitter and i ain't got time for that because the older I get, the more I realize the most valuable thing we have on this planet is time. Because it's finite. And once it's over with, there's no reset button. It, this isn't Mario Kart. You can't run over a, a, a piece of fruit and get an extra five seconds or whatever. It, it's, it, it's done. It's over with. And I ain't got the time to deal with people who just want to fucking sit around and be assholes to other people and try to tear everybody else down. And it, I mean... I get people. I, people I work with. Some of them are like, "Oh, you do a podcast?" Yeah, and you can almost hear the contempt in their voice. Like, "Oh, so you think you're fucking hot shit?" You, no, I don't fucking think I'm hot shit. And the fact that you had to come ask me if I do a podcast or not should tell you that I don't think I'm fucking all that. I'm not running around telling you what I do. You heard that from other fucking people, didn't you? I didn't come up and fucking shove it in your face and say, "Hey, have you listened? We're great. You need to check us out." You know, I, so people like that, eh, later for you, dude. I I don't have the patience and I don't have the, the, the will or the desire to deal with people like that. And I, you know, once again, you have to make the distinction. Is it a friend coming up to you going, dude, you kind of smell like a bum's nut sack, seriously. Okay. I wish you to put it a little bit differently, but that is kind of funny and I appreciate it. Versus a person coming, you know snickering at you behind your back and wait until there's five or six people standing next to them and then they're going to fucking call you out in a crowd of people. Right. But, yeah. I I, I don't know. It, 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 it Once again, I guess the older I get, the more I understand it takes very little effort to encourage people to go, hey man, give it a try. And if you give something a try and it fails, what what did you lose? I'm not talking investing all your fucking money to the point where, you know, I invested all my money in GameStop and GameStop went tits up. Now I'm fucking living on the street. That's stupid. But to encourage someone to create something, to do something that might bring a few people a little, you know, a smile to their face. Why, why is that frowned upon? Why is that looked down upon? Why is it like... It, 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 it's more it's more acceptable to walk around and shit on things no, than it is. Uh, well, I, I hear you, though. I mean, like we were saying earlier with the social media and the people that are always positive on it, I don't follow those people. I follow a bunch of people who make snarky, shitty jokes about them, <laughs> you know, about themselves or other people or whatever. Or, I, I don't know. I think that I, is... I, I, you, I, I hear you, but I, but I, but it's fighting against our, our nature to be that way too. But see, you said something that's very important. If they're snarky, if they're as snarky with themselves as they are other people, I right. tend to, I tend to give them a little bit more fucking leeway, and I tend to forgive them a little, a lot easier because yeah. they're just taking the piss out of everybody. They're, they're those are type people that like seem to those are type people that when you get your head in the clouds and you're really floating around up there, they go, hey, come back to Earth for a second. It's nice that you're doing this, but you're not fucking Howard Stern. Come back down to Earth. You know, don't quit, don't quit, don't, 
don't quit your job to do unregimented five days a week just yet, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. That's a helpful, once again, helpful criticism, constructive criticism. Wow. Can you hear that? It's, I think somebody has died in their car. Is that a horn? Yeah. Or is it a siren? That's it. This is yeah. a straight up horn. Like, some, wait, I'm gonna, like someone's in an accident and they leaned forward and I mean, they're, they're just slumped over their steering wheel or something. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, I can't tell where it's coming from exactly. I don't see any anybody at... Uh, yeah, it's definitely... It's not a car alarm. I well, guess good it's possible for-, for a horn to break. You know what? I better make sure it's not my car. And then my <laughs> horn just didn't break. Wait, let me take the headphones off real quick. I'm going to try right. and listen. No, it's definitely coming from across the way. But it's not... I don't even see any, like, lights on or anything. Like, it's somebody's alarm. Yeah, I don't know. It happens. Somebody's just... Somebody's so... Shut the fuck up. (laughs) You live in an apartment, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. See, that's... I hear... It's a a townhouse, actually, Rich. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, my bad. I didn't. I, I didn't. I don't know. It's not like I've been over. Which, you know, <laughs> which is which is what you call a, a two story apartment. An apartment with stairs. Well, my thing is, yeah. If you have a parking lot full of cars, you're you're liable to hear anything. I have to say, one of the things I'm glad that this <clears throat> the, the people who run the place where I live, and that's about as polite as I can be about it, put up a sign in the hallways. Uh, do not let off fireworks, blah, blah, blah. It's against your lease. There will be no, be no warnings. It is considered a violation of your lease. You will be evicted. And I was like, thank the fuck Christ. Because for the first week, uh, or for about a week before they put that up, every fucking night, I mean, till 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, people were letting fireworks off in the fucking parking lot. Man. And I'm like, that's just ridiculous, dude. Come on, man. It's 3, 4 in the morning. Yeah, I, mean, I got a whole a whole list from my landlord about all the all the rules for you know with summertime here like there's certain after ten don't play your music loud and try and if your kids are gonna go outside and play have them go play in the in the open area and not right in front of people's houses and shit and just this whole list of things that like. Just get, rules that get broken on a daily basis. <laughs> oh yeah, and I don't know. I, I I guess I'm just more live and let live with that type of shit, unless it's going to be really like fucked up and distracting or or whatever. But you know, well, I'm the, I, I'm, I, the, I'm the same way. We're not supposed to wash clothes after nine o'clock. We have a yeah. twelve hour window to wash clothes nine in the morning to nine at night. I understand that. Some people don't work a regular nine to five these days. The only time that they have a day off, you know, if they work midnights, they're waking up at eight o'clock on their day off because that's time when they wake up to go to work at 10 o'clock at night or whatever. So that, you know, they might be running the washer and dryer at one o'clock in the morning. I don't give a shit. But if I'm going to let shit slide, I want shit to be, you know, to slide in my favor, too. And that's the issue I run into with with apartment living. Everybody wants their shit to slide. No one wants to let anyone else's shit slide. Right. And I, uh, yeah. yeah I, I want to play my music loud sometimes. So do I bitch when other people, well, yeah, I'll bitch, but I don't go to the landlord or the office, rather, and file a complaint about them or call the police on them because I don't want that, you know. I I don't do it at ridiculous hours either, I I'm not completely ignorant of the fact that I share walls with other people. Well, I mean, that's, you know, that's the other thing. I, that's why I'm not, one of the many reasons I'm not re-upping my lease here is, you know, I, I was here two months. I woke up on a Sunday morning, or excuse me, Saturday morning, and it was 8.30 in the morning, and I woke up and I put music on, and I went about, you know, my morning routine. And then the yeah. next thing I know, someone's pounding my door. It's my next-door neighbor. Hey man, you need to turn that shit down, man. I'm tired of hearing this shit. Blah 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 blah. It's eight thirty in the morning, dude. And literally, when I step outside my apartment, shut the door, and take two steps from it, I can't hear it. So, no, 
I don't need to turn it down. You, right. you, you need to understand there's sound ordinances and I'm not breaking it. And what I didn't know is that he works for the complex. So he called the owner. So I had the owner of the complex at my door a half hour later <laughs> threatening to evict me for playing music at 830 in the morning on a Saturday. And that's when I said, hey, if you want to evict me for that, I'll see you in court. And yeah. pretty much outside of some passive aggressive, them blasting music or they hear, you know, because the walls are paper thin here. They, you know, when they hear me start doing the podcast, either with you guys or with, with Chris and, and Earl, them blasting music in, in the background. And I'm like, well, half the time it doesn't come through. So I don't care right. if you want to do that. Be petty, be petty. But I mean, that was ridiculous to me. I, and my thing was, if you, because he kept telling me, you know, the guy kept telling me and the landlord that, no, you're in the wrong. He's in the right. And I said, well, if he's so right, why didn't he call the cops? And the cops come here and give me a ticket for a noise violation. <laughs> yeah, good point. Why did he call you, his boss, who happens to own this pl- or that he works for, who owns this place? If I was talking to a police officer, I would have been in the wrong. As it stands, you both are in the wrong. And so once that happened, I knew that, yeah, I wasn't going to. Re-up, <laughs> re-up my lease. This isn't the place for me. So, yeah. yeah. Good old apartment living. God, I love it. Oh, shit. All right. Well, we've vented about where we lived enough. Should we wrap this up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we're about done for this episode. But thanks for listening, everyone. And, uh, Thanks for, well, uh, if you've shared this show with somebody, you reviewed it, you know, just uh, told somebody else about it, we definitely appreciate you. You can probably, well, I know you can follow us on uh, Twitter and Facebook and, and that stuff. And is there anything else I'm missing? What else do we normally say at the end? What does Chris normally say? Go to go to iTunes if you like us. Uh, rate us. Yeah, right five stars and because apparently that i didn't realize this apparently that that actually really helps the rating on itunes i didn't i didn't realize how much until listening to other podcasts because apparently if you get enough people rating you it they it put it more out front where you don't have to dig for it or know exactly where to look for the, exactly. the podcast you know, start which, dropping into those categories of like you know you want to see hear a comedy podcast well here's the top whatever i actually you get like a top 100 list from them in in all different categories so yeah def- definitely uh reviewing us helps increase the invisibility the invisibility increase the visibility of this show yeah and i know that one of our biggest fans she she said she found it through uh just that finding it you know stumbling upon it i mean it, it, it's nice. it, uh, it wasn't word of mouth. It's not like a friend of a friend, you know. So that's when I hear that, that, that makes me think we're, we're doing this for more than just us and the cats, you know. Because <laughs> 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 I feel like we do this for like you know us and then the animals that are in the house while we're doing it. Sometimes so like no one listens to this. <laughs> Which right? Is, yeah, you know, we record them and then it kind of feels like we're just you know throwing it out into the void there. So when we do get feedback or, you know, Chris shares some numbers with us and shows us that, you know, we've been uh, increasing our listenership month after month, which is the, the, the case, it does feel really good. Yeah, because I kind of default inherited the Facebook page for the, the uh, Unregimented and uh, that was about a month or two ago, um, some gentleman from like... I, I like somewhere in the Pacific Northwest who I, has no like he's not one of our mutual friends or whatever was like hey man love your podcast blah 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 glad you guys are back I'm like back so that means that he was there before we you know took that nine right. month sabbatical so right that means he listened long enough to know that we were gone yeah and I'm like oh shit this is for real like I, <laughs> because I mean I have to say sometimes it's nice when you think no one's listening because it gives you a freedom to just say whatever but then again at right. the same time it's nice to know that you know people actually take the time to listen so no you're, you're absolutely right I think when I when we're recording the podcast I think especially on Regimented for me I'm not really thinking about my voice going out to other people 
I don't think that I I would speak as freely if I was constantly thinking about that in the forefront. Um, I don't think that I could have the same conversation in front of a live audience. You know? I I think that's where where Chris and I become maybe because we both went to Specs, and he actually worked in radio for a while there. Right. Uh, yeah. We're a little bit more comfortable. Like if we did li- if we did these shows live and then posted the podcast later, I, I my fear would be that I would actually start playing to the audience more than I should. Yeah. Not, not that I would, not that I would clam up, but that I'd go the other way. You know. Yeah. Well, who knows? But yeah, we were wrapping this up, right? Uh, Saying, yeah. Apparently. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for listening, and we will definitely see you next week. All right. Later, guys. If you like this show, please tell a friend. Please follow us on Twitter and like and share us on Facebook by searching for Christopher Media. You can subscribe to all ChristopherMedia.net shows for free on ChristopherMedia.net. Please make sure to rate and comment on all your favorite Christopher Media shows. Thank you in advance for supporting Christopher Media by clicking on the PayPal button and by clicking through to all the sponsors who support ChristopherMedia.net. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net. And thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net. Curated by Kohl's latest collection is now available in select stores and at Kohl's.com. For a limited time, shop unexpected new favorites like reusable drinkware from Corksicle and fun arts and crafts from UB. With new collections all the time, Curated by Kohl's has something for everyone. Warmies, heatable plush toys are perfect for little ones. Homesick handcrafted candles are a great gift to make anyone feel at home. And who doesn't love sweet treats from Candy Club? Shop Curated by Kohl's for these digital need-to-know brands and more. Tap the banner now or visit Kohl's.com. This weekend, get to Kohl's and take an extra 15% off. Save on tech gear for the family, now just $15.29 and under. The Ninja Foodie Indoor Grill is $279.99. And find denim everyone in the family will love for $18.69 and under. Plus, get a little more for your wallet with Kohl's Cash. Plus, fast and free store pickup. Shop Kohl's and Kohl's.com. Select styles, 15% offer valid January 14th through January 18th with promo code SNOWMAN. Some exclusions apply. See store or Kohl's.com for details.